Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, everybody. How's everybody doing? Happy Sunday. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. What do we got there? Chris Corsi. Yep, football, schmuck ball. It is opening weekend NFL. Second weekend of college. Yeah, I did just shut it all down. It was way too distracting to have uh, any kind of apps open or anything to check scores while I stream. <laughs> so that's a no. I'm just going to have to wait. You guys can free to tell whatever. There's, it's whatever. You guys can talk football. So if you see scores and stuff, it's okay. Um, big race in Italy this morning. Yeah, that went, that went kind of crazy. I mean, if you're a McLaren fan, it went pretty well. Uh, what else we got? Chris Corsi. Dan, how are you watching the Jets lose? <laughs> right? Can you the rebuilding century? Yeah, there's no answer there. Uh, what do we got? Josh, hello. Dennis, hello. Matt, 58. Hello, hello. Andy Butcher, finally made it to a live session. Welcome, Andy. Dimitri, hello, everybody. Mike Huffnagel, hey, gentlemen. Are you off today? Hopefully, a little uh, relaxation. I imagine because of the 20 year anniversary, you might be on call, though, just in case, right? Uh, 2FS Brin, hello. Zal, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Phil, hello. Welcome back. Mark Burgess, hey, Mark. How you doing? Saw the Italian GP. I did. I've uh, I've up my uh, F1 subscription to full live viewing, so the second half of the season will be pretty good for uh, the GP season. Uh, what else we got here? Jets are going to go at 15. <laughs> Their first round pick again. Yeah, maybe. No, you got a good team. It just, you know, these things take time now. They need some stability more than anything else. Uh, you're off. Good. Oh, okay. Well, happy anniversary. Welcome to the stream. Wife's like, what are you doing? Uh, here from early start for work tomorrow. Yeah, what time is it there, Mark? Is it, what, 10 p.m., 11 p.m.? Noisy Foisy, present for class. Greetings. Ready for some Jimmy Jams. Yep, got them all set up, ready to go. Little Jimmy Jams. Good morning from New Zealand, TC. How are you? It's Monday morning. This week is already off and running. What's up, Conan? How are you? Anders Broden, hello. Good to know. Nog in the nog, there he is. How you doing, Mike? What is it, uh, 8, 8 a.m.? Something like that. 8 or 9 a.m. for you guys. Oh, 8 p.m. Burgess, okay. What is it? Yeah, that's right. That's right, this is noon time for me, so uh, 8 p.m. Europe, England, UK. 9 p.m., 8, 9 p.m. in Europe. Uh, hello there, how you doing? I'm good, Ozzy, how you doing? I've been up since uh, 7 a.m. here, too, so I'm a little bit like, ready to go. <laughs> um, couldn't sleep last night. Good evening from the U.K., Greg Riley. Yeah, 7 a.m., okay. Yeah, because, yeah, same here. I woke up about 7 today, too. Yep, got all the football in yesterday. All the college stuff happened yesterday. Um, and then we had Formula One this morning. Tennis fans, anybody out there in the tennis world? I know that's a U.S. Open stuff going. Uh, there was a big win for this, the girls this morning, uh, the British girl. I don't know who's what. I don't know what spoilers are out there, what spoilers are not out there anymore. <laughs> I forget what's what. Uh, yeah, Mark's up at five tomorrow. Oof. Is the sun even up at 5 a.m.? I know sunset, sunrise here is like 6.30, so it's it's 5, 5 a.m. I don't know. That's the one thing. Waking up when it's dark, even for a flight or something like that, that's a hard no-go for me. Not a fan. Not a fan. Do some adjustments. I always have to adjust. You'd think it'd be the same every every effing week with the stuff, and it's it, there's always, like, movement. <laughs> no sun at 5 a.m. There is no sun at 5 a.m. Absolutely. That should be somebody's Instagram tag, at no sun at 5 a.m. <laughs> Dimitri Prosko, those minis on the table do not look like a train. No, the train's right here, my friend. <laughs> it's right here. Don't worry. I got you covered. I'm not fun funning you, uh, but I often talk about some other stuff first before we roll into the main thing. And in fact, we're going to do a little pigments on the, some armor before we get to the train. We'll do the train towards the second two-thirds of the show. Happy Sunday, Arnell. Happy Sunday. Uh, traffic lights aren't even solid. <laughs> Everything's a blur, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, coffee doesn't even work at 5 a.m. for me. Uh, 
what else we got there? Brian Matthews, hello. How you doing? From Northampton. Uh, so Anders, you're in Norway. Okay. Sweet. I thought maybe that was a German name for a second, but you are in Norway. God, I haven't been to Norway since uh, 2013. That is a country I need to go back to. We had a really, really nice time. Um, I think it was the IPMS Norway show. Um, hairspray over hairspray. There's only one layer of hairspray on that, I think. Uh, very carefully, so. Giuseppe A10, I'm working on the M3 Grant tack on. How is that kit? Am I correct in that nobody's produced a cast hole Lee yet for anything? Like mini R tack on, nobody's done the cast hole. Is there a cast hole M3 besides the Cromwell resin conversion, which I already have? You can't cough it by the pot. <laughs> the cough, right? Yeah, just put a straw in the, in the pot. Uh, Dimitri, your Sunday's almost on, almost over. Yep, it's going to be evening for most of uh, Europe. Monday for Asia, Pacific, you know, the Western Rim of the Pacific, I guess. I would call it the Western Rim of the Pacific. Australia fans should be happy today. Your boy, Danny Ricardo, bringing it. Mini art, I just think they released. Did they do a cast? Okay, I'll keep that in mind. I have enough of the riveted holes M3s in my time. I don't, I'm not itching to do one, but I've always wanted to do a cast hole M3. Uh, it's been fun, easy build. Okay, that's good. Yeah, it tack them, you hear kind of good and bad sometimes, hit and miss. You know, some of the kits are good. I mean, that's typical Chinese output. You know, some of the crews that they use to hire, some of the, the CAD, some of the toolings, a little bit of hit and miss with China. I'm sure they're produced out of China if they're not using the trumpeter factories. I forget who's using what now. Dominique, hello, hello. Gosh, or just Google Tacom does have an M3A1. Okay, sweet. So Mini Art and Tacom both have cast holes. Okay. I'm not paying close enough attention. I'm still in, in awe of, of the T-Rex uh, tool brackets. And then I did pull out, um, I had some Shapeways tool brackets I purchased a couple years ago. Actually weren't that bad. I forget what company made them. Uh, who was doing the CAD files through Shapeways. Um, and then I did have MJ miniatures out of Korea, uh, Manjin. Uh, I got his sets, his Allied and his, his German sets. And I looked at those and they're actually pretty close to the T-Rex set. They're really, really nicely detailed. I actually hadn't opened those boxes yet. That was kind of funny. Uh, the thing with the T-Rex set, the, the, um, the tool clamps from the other episode I showed was that they have a lot of open ones and different position ones too. So that was kind of, um, MJs are all closed up. So I do like the fact that there's some open ones in the T-Rex set. Bryce, hello, how are you? 1208. Yeah, we'll go a few more minutes. Uh, yeah, guys, if you have a question, put the word question in front of your question and we'll get some early questions out of the way here. Um, hairspray over hairspray back to you, Zal, just real quick. Uh, I know a lot of guys freak out about that. It's not that big of a deal because oftentimes you don't chip over the same spot that you chipped previously. You're moving along. So if you paint it properly, you usually don't have too much of a problem. Sometimes you'll pull up some, some lower coats. Uh, if you feel like you're going to have a lot of problems, let's throw a, a flat coat in between. It's no big deal. Don't overthink it, basically. Just just roll through the process. Uh, Dimitri Sunday is almost over. Got his Vezza T28. Nice. I do want to do that 70 second scale one that came out a few years ago. I never got to that. I think it was a really nice kit. I saw, um, I think Bay and Wu did one. Really, really nice T28 and 70 second scale. It's a good tank for 70 second scale. Even though I have seen the real T28 in Finland, uh, it's smaller than you think. You think it's a beast of a tank and it's not. In fact, the Churchill was smaller than I thought. Uh, the T28 was smaller than I thought. Um, yeah. The Stug's pretty wide, too. When you see a Stug up close, because it doesn't have a turret on top, you, it's, 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 it's got that really nice width to it. Because um, I saw a dark brown chip. Oh, that's the, it's the oil paints on top. So. Yeah, there's only one layer of hairspray on the, on the dome. It's right there. It's right behind me. All you're seeing, Zal, is just, um, he's talking about this. He's asking about this, this guy. So that's just hairspray chipping. It's a dark brown base with a white top coat, hairspray in between. 
uh, and then the oil paints for the weather and for the rust and all the different patina and everything. Actually, we'll get to this model probably in, in a week or so in terms of, of continuing on. We did some weathering on that side. Um, then we got this guy. Then we have to finish this guy. The weapons that I've been working on, the Gundam weapons, are for this model in particular. So, to bed pretty soon. Yeah, he's getting close. Yeah, that's OPR over hairspray chipping. That's what that is. Uh, even from South Africa, L scale model. How's everyone doing? I haven't had anybody from South Africa for a while. Rosso Brevet, my friend, how are you? Even Mouse is not as big as that. Yeah, yeah, Mouse is a pretty compact vehicle. It's just got really thick armor. Um, Tiger II is pretty big. That's an imposing. The Panther was the one that was really, the size of a Panther is, is impressive. A Panther is a big tank, physically a big tank. Um, I think it has some rel relatively thin armor for its size, probably, but it's, it's a large vehicle. Hatches are pretty small. Um, some of the half tracks are big too. Some of the bigger half tracks are, are quite large. And SWS is pretty big. Obviously, the FAM. FAM is enormous. If you've never seen a FAM up close, FAM is like a, a big rig truck on the street. It's huge. Yeah, I've been lucky. I've been to Munster, uh, Duxford, um, Parola in Finland. And then um, did we look at there's an M48 in Norway. Um, I don't know if it was an Oslo or not. I can't remember where we went through. It's going back almost 10 years on that trip, so I can't remember what cities we went to in Norway when I landed. Because the first couple of days of that trip into Norway, um, my guides took me around a few places, but we did see an M48. Um, but yeah, from World War II stuff, it's um, Sherman's pretty good size, of course, um, but Churchill's are smaller than you. All the British stuff's pretty small, actually. When you see the British tanks up close, they're, they're pretty small. Um, like your head is like at a point where you're like, huh, I didn't think I would be that tall, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think a T-35 is, is considerably larger than a T-28, but T-28 was not that big physically. Uh, what else? Uh, finish the scale model using OPR. Thanks, had fun applying your techniques. Really looks the part. You demand. Thank you, Al. Appreciate that. Yeah, Tiger II is impressive in real life. It is legit. Like, I think if you switch that to Chobam and put a turbine in, in with the bigger gun with some range finders, a Tiger II would still be a tough tank. <laughs> you know, that whole thing. <laughs> Uh, it's basically a Leopard 2, realistically. It's it's pretty uh, pretty solid vehicle. Yeah, because I've been to Le Glaze in Belgium uh, in the Ardennes. That's that's an interesting thing. I don't know how they fought a war in the, in the Ardennes. <laughs> it's like the Grand Canyon. It's like the slopes of the hills are so ridiculously steep. Uh, people, well, they were. I, I think that actually is true, Zal, to be honest with you. I think there is a, there is the general height of humans has, has increased over time. But they do actually... Um, I know certain countries had height requirements for armor crews, which is why the Sherman was as big as it was. And the M3 is as big as the M3 Lee is as tall and as roomy as it is because they have a much broader range of soldiers that can fit in it, which I think is why the Russians liked it too. The Shermans, they really like that stuff because there's a lot more room than say a T-34, which they just jam you in like sardines. You know, you're five, if you're over 5'4", you know, 1.5 meters, if you're taller than that, you're tough. it's tough to fit in a lot of the World War II stuff. But that was intentional. I think, I think Stug crews had to be a certain height um, Tiger crews are probably a little bit taller guys. Why you don't, Dimitri, could you please switch cameras when we speak? Nothing happens at the table. And yeah, no problem, Dimitri. We got you. <laughs> Sorry. I need to piss them off. Um, what else? Yeah, aircraft are huge. Yeah. Even in the, in the relation of a small aircraft, the Japanese zeros are pretty tiny, um, pretty small which is why they're so maneuverable. When you see a Wildcat and then you see a Hellcat and then you see a Corsair and then you see a P-47 and then you see like a P-38, P-38 is like an air, airliner. You're like, what? <laughs> that thing is enormous. Yeah. The German stuff's pretty, 109s are pretty small. Um, P-40s are, are decent size. Yeah. P-47 up close and in, in person was, uh, I saw one at Chino a couple of years ago or a while ago. Uh, L's on the, on the question of the hairspray, uh, I usually go with the medium or light hold if you can. The strong, strong holds tend to fight you a little bit, especially if they're heavy lacquer uh, air, hairsprays or they have a lot of alcohol in them. They'll fight you a little bit. Um, that's always been my recommendation is kind of a, a medium. Yeah, F-104 is a pretty small jet. In fact, it's literally just a, an engine with the dude strapped in the nose, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, then you see like an F-15 or something like that, and it's, it's as big as a 737. You're, you're like, okay. Because we have them here in Portland, we have a uh, Oregon Air Guard flies out of Portland International, and you'll you'll be in your your local jets, and then they'll be cruising by, and you're almost like at the pilot's eyeballs. You're like, whoa, dude, dude, that's a big plane. 
familiar with the 26 can't picture the 28 in my mind which one are you talking t26 and t28 der ka first first time seeing spitfires of shock yep oh we just mentioned that i must say that the dicker max is a real big um yeah i would think that you've seen the ross have you been there's only probably the one left right or i think the russians have the dicker max yeah i would say that's probably it was a what is that gun is that a 12.8 no it's, it's a 10.5 right the Dicker Max, it was a real specialty vehicle. It's bigger than a Nashorn, I believe. Um, there's only like two, though, that went in country. And I think they they tested well, but I guess it was just wasn't what they were looking for. Maybe the gun was, was whatever. I thought it was a 10.5 on the Dicker Max. It does have the really cool muzzle brake, though. I like the shape of it. Uh, what else we got here? Museum in Oslo, their tanks. Yeah. Um, and I went to the aircraft museum in Finland, too, before we flew out. Is it a 128 on the Dicker Max? Is it a 10.5 or 12.8? I forget which gun. It's probably one of the big air anti aircraft guns. Um, but yeah, I also went to the, I was saying I went to the aircraft museum in Finland. Uh, I forget what city that's in. That was, that's impressive. They got the original Buffalo, you know, in the original colors, un, unrestored. Um, and then when I was in um, Croatia at Zagreb, went to their museum too, and, and they have a, a, a their P 47. Um, it just takes up the whole museum. So funny. Um, uh, I, I do follow Coldham, Coldham, whatever, however you say his name. I do follow him on Instagram. Uh, George Old School, how are you doing? Mark Burgess had three turrets, one main gun, and two turrets, yeah. Yeah, those two little turrets on the T-28 are like little machine gun turrets. Mother Russia provide the room for a tank, yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, what else we got? First week of the past second week. Okay. Greg Bradley. Did you have something going on, Greg? Did I miss? Are you in the hospital? Oh, that's right. I think you were mentioned you were in the hospital for some, right? Am I correct in that? I forget. Okay. T Rex have their own website. Uh T Rex on Facebook are now. Uh, I'm not sure if they have their own website or not. Uh, but I would try them through their Facebook page. A lot of those smaller companies, they they run a Facebook page and then sometimes there's a web link to order and stuff on. But all right, let's get rolling. Get rolling, rolling. What's it? 12th? Yeah, do some stuff. So I put this up on Instagram yesterday. I've got both of them out here. Calamity is a really cool um, gun to mecha designer. If you guys don't know who Luca is, um, but I wanted to show this off. This is a little resin 1220 scale kit. This one will be hand painted. We're going to, I'm going to do some hand painting stuff here in the next couple weeks on it. That'll be kind of fun because when you do brush painted work uh, for a full model, it's a little bit different look, different vibe. So I'm excited for this, but I, I put this put this together the other night in about a couple hours. Um, I took all the resin apart and I pinned everything. There's little metal pins and all those stuff, so I can I can move him around and do some things. Pretty delicate, but pretty cool. Um, and I, I just have him out so you can see. So he, the relative size. He's a little dude. <laughs> Doesn't even come up to the. the this guy's not very big at all, and this guy was like, I'm like, huh? He's as wide as he is tall. Schnabel gun, calamity, Luca. Really cool. One of the one of the better mecha designers uh, around today. That's not Japanese, so that'll be up in the in a future stream. And then today we're going to start on actually on the on the Stug. I promised uh, my boy Mike and stream some some airbrush pigment work just to refresh. So we'll start with that. And the reason is is because I have a fresh OPR palette over here, and I'm just giving it the maximum amount of time. So we got a fresh palette here. It's letting it juice up. We're going to use that in today's stream. But on this dude here, so we're going to spray some pigments on the bottom of this. I want to show a quick re re refreshing um, of this process real quick. Basically, I'm going to put down some dust pigments uh, and then I'm going to airbrush the fixer on top. All right, what do we got here? Question T-Rex, have their own website. Let's hurry. This is a long Patriots game starts in an hour and a half. Um, yeah, let's see. We got a lot of football on. Uh, what else we got here? Just okay. Surprise, a small Tiger one. Yeah, Tiger one's not the biggest. Tiger two is considerably bigger. Same with the Yag Tiger. Same with the Sturm. Sturm Tiger is pretty solid. Uh, Brumbar is pretty big in person. Um, Hetzer is pretty small. Like, you don't even know how people get in the Hetzer when you see the hatches and you see the motor. I don't even know how they were even able to use it. Um, what else we got here? 
I better use an email. Yeah. Got your answer on the hairspray. You guys are good there. No, I actually don't think so. Oh, what do you guys? Luca is awesome. Luca is the man. Uh, he does some phenomenal. His custom work on Gunpla is pretty impressive too. Uh, I've known Luca actually for quite a few years. So when the Schnabel gun is one of his older designs, if not his original, that he started making resin kits with. And when he produced the, the new version, the Schnabel Geist, which is a different weapon system, I grabbed one of those because I keep missing his re, re, uh, his resin runs. And then that little dude was available. He threw that in my package for me. Uh, question, I'm thinking of painting some sci-fi models and maybe some post-apocalyptic stuff. What's the major difference between painting things and sci-fi models? Reference, you don't have a frame of reference for sci-fi. So historical vehicles, civilian or military, doesn't really matter. As you have reference, you can go look at stuff. The sci-fi stuff, you don't. So you have to kind of cross the bridge of a, if you want a realistic look, you have to cross the bridge between looking outside at the real world and then putting it onto the science fiction world. So it's going to be studying, you know, construction equipment, things of relatable size, depends on what you're doing. Hey, Timothy, how are you? You're just in time, buddy. Just getting ready to roll. Um, model guy used a lot of the techniques on his Corsair. Demos really helped out. You're welcome, model guy. What Corsair did you do? A South Pacific or um, Navy Blue? Speaking of Sturm Tiger, just got Panzer X new books studying. Yeah, that looked like a pretty good book. Uh, nobody over here has really stocked it yet in the U.S. that I can tell, but I'll, I might pick that up too. Yeah, Wayne says he got to sit in a P-47 in, in Connecticut. There's a lot of room. In, yeah, P-47 is could be an, a small airliner. It is a um, you talk about it and they read about it all the time how big a P-47 was, but when you actually see one, uh, I remember when they rolled it out at, at Chino. This might have been ten years ago. It was all a natural metal finish, but just the landing gear height to the wing height. You know, compared to the, because you see the lineup of the, you know, there's Avengers and there's Hellcats and Corsairs and stuff. And, and there's a lot of Mustangs, of course, seen a lot of Mustangs in my time. But um, yeah, P-47 is a big plane. And then the, then they have a P-38 on the tricycle gear standing up. And it's a whole, <laughs> like, what? it's got two of the, and is you can just, it's just insane some of the, how they fight in some of those things. Um, but yeah, cool stuff though. Very cool to see that stuff in person. Uh, what else we got? We had two F-15s fly overhead yesterday. Usually you don't hear the air guard. They have strict rules for, for sound. I know in Europe, you probably have big strict rules for fighter jet sounds too over populated areas, but they do have to kind of fly over us sometimes. And you can hear them when they do the cutoff and they have to kind of coast over town for the sound. Hello, Robert, how are you? Matt 58, doing your job. I appreciate that. Everybody hit that like button, hit that, hit that uh, subscribe. Uh, let's get going on some pigments here. So what we're going to do, and, and I know many of you guys are familiar, but if you're not familiar, I'm going to lay down a dust coat on a dark panzer gray base, and then I'm going to airbrush. You probably just use it. Here. Just... We'll just use a light coat. Oh, I don't have my books out. Oh, hold on one second. Let me grab my books, guys. Be right back. Give me two seconds. Don't go anywhere. I forgot to have the books out. So this is a, a fairly common technique that I actually use um, when I want to lay down dust. There's questions last couple streams about maybe airbrush and dust first and stuff. What do you think about painting figures as part of our hobby? What do I think about painting figures as part of our hobby? Well, you know, fine. <laughs> I don't really have an opinion on figures. I don't do a lot of them. You know, it's like just if you like to do them, that's that's fine. You know what I mean? Um, for me, with with the combination of, of armor, diorama, whatever you're doing with figures, the only thing I look at is uh, it, it's important for me that the style matches the, the piece. So if you're going to paint your figures in a certain artistic style and your other stuff isn't in the same kind of style, it, to me, it always looks a little funny. But yeah, I don't I don't have any real opinions either way. You know, you know, what I'm saying like this. Figures are figures, little mini people. I don't like big people, so I'm not going to like a lot of little people either. <laughs> that uh, what else? What's up, Mark Schweigler? How are you? Okay, so one of the little tricks of the trade here that I'd like to get into for, for a while now, and it's specific to this particular, ooh, that's an up close and personal look. And him out. So in Tank Art 1 in particular, uh, there's also in Tank Art 2 on my M3 Lee, in that one, speaking of Lees, um, this look right here, this this heavy dust look on a, on, a, on a dark base, this is useful for almost anything, trains, whatever. Um, it's one of my favorite photos. 
but anywho, this this mostly this dust work here of, of how you layer this up, how you get all this little Jimmy Jams going on in there. Um, I can show you some of that right now because I was asked about that the other day and I told I told the guy I would show you. <laughs> so I'm going to show you. Uh, we've shown it before in the other in the pigment streams, too. I have shown this uh, this process before. So I have some in my airbrush. Uh, just some regular uh, paint thinner. It is because the base paint is a Mission Models paint. I've got Mission Models thinner in there. And I'm going to crank down the pressure so it, you want really, really low air pressure. I'm just listening. I'm using my Mac valve here. Uh, I have a Mac valve right here to lower the pressure because you're going to want to spit that. Basically, what you have is you have a matte coat of paint. Um, it works best with darker colors, but you can use this with basically any color of, of paint that you have. Um, and then your pigment colors are, of course, whatever your choice of dirt and dust. Um, Dimitri, I won't discuss new tank art edition. Like what I won't tell you. You won't know until I deb debut them. But it'll be tanks. <laughs> well, you already know German allied armor. So it's going to be just a rotation. But I won't tell you what's coming in next until we're ready to go. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a lot more like Tamiya with future <laughs> release notes on, on what's going on. That's for sure. Um, okay, so let's see here. Okay, so I'm just using the bottom of this because it's the only thing I had kind of like ready to go and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Um, what do we got here? We're looking more of the books about it. Uh, Panther Rex, yeah, Panther. What are, you, what are you probably talking about, Panther Rex? Um, he's doing train art. Yep. Well, it'll be train art. Yeah. There'll be, there'll be art books for all the stuff. Okay. So what do we got here? So I'm just pulling some pigments on a, on a, a big old brush here. It's, it's my standard pigment brush. Okay. It doesn't want to focus. I'm already making a mess. Just an old round brush. Real simple process. And this is specifically to create a dusty appearance. And the stippling kind of gives you that little bit of patchiness to it. Making sure everything's working. Music's probably a little low for you guys. The music, can you guys hear the music okay? It might be a little low for you guys. Um, um, what's new? So. Okay, so now your question is, uh, I don't want to discuss what that would be in there. I mean, should I have all? Oh, yeah, of course you should have all of them. <laughs> that answer to that is yes, Dimitri. Of course, my friend. What do you want me to say? No. <laughs> of course I'm going to say yes. But I do break down the books, you know, for certain groups of um, what you guys are into. Uh, going off of my experience in the hobby. Uh, music, okay, cool. Yeah, I've got it lower in my ear. Um just because there's the music, this particular channel has some sounds that sound uh, songs that pop up on the volume. So, yeah, no, you're a little bit sensitive, so I, I do that for you, my friend. Okay, so I just basically stipple the dust on. So that is actually, if you looked at that, is very similar to the to the front of the Tiger One, the hole. This could be the side of anything; it doesn't really matter. I'm just showing you the technique. I'm not really trying to impress with with the bottom of a tank. Um, but it's a stippling action where you've got kind of, and you'll have some of this looseness uh, around here um, because you've just got a lot of pigment. I put a little bit too much pigments down, but I was trying to cover the whole thing in one shot, which I've, I've got a good little, it actually doesn't look that bad. Got a little bit of glare off the, it's a cloudy overcast day here for where our weather shifted to the fall. We're pretty much summer's over. Hello, Vivian, how are you? Hello from Virginia. Okay, so this process here, um, Airbrush, there's thinner in there from a distance of about 12, 12 inches, about a foot. What is it, about 20, 25 centimeters? So it's going to blow it up. There's a lot of loose pigments down right now. But you see that spitting? See how it's, it hits with kind of the little spots? And I'm just, you can hear the noise. Just spitting that, that dust down. And that's a, just a quick fix. It kind of gets a, a nice little first layer done. Grab a little bit more. And this is where you start really can building up your opacity. 
I'm being a little bit more sporadic now with my application. That way it's got a little bit of an une unevenness to it. And this is why I prefer this process over airbrushing dust, even though I am kind of technically airbrushing dust in, in a form. So I just spritzed some fixer down. This is layer three. Again, I'm just kind of working in a cloudy random pattern. And I would use the shape of whatever it is that I'm that I'm working on specifically to kind of develop out, you know, if it's the side of the tank or if it's the side of the front, you know, whatever it is I'm really doing. Um, it, but you can use this on the side of a Gundam leg. You can use this on the side of, I'm trying to think what else, you know, any kind of construction equipment, dozers, dump trucks. Kind of spritzing over the camera here. So you can see now it's starting to build up some of that pass. So you can actually come in a little bit closer. And that paint thinner will, will, will see, there you go. Now you're starting to, I'm starting to get a really nice uh, embedded dust look under those suspension arms. So that was what, three? Um, Josh says, you know, definitely catch you. Oh, you're fine, Josh. Thanks for swinging by, man. No worries at all. Uh, I don't have anything to, I don't have, let's see here. Let's see if we can get something out of this guy. So I've got my old OPR palette from the other day too. Let's see. Uh, oh, where'd you go? All right, I'll try this one. What you can do now is do a little speckling. Let me see if I can get some colors off of this first. Maybe we swing back to that. do some more spec. What I would do at this point in time is I would start speckling in um, some oil colors, which I didn't have quite set up in time. Didn't think that out far enough. Yep, front of a locomotive, anything. Yep, that's a good technique for a lot of stuff. But when you guys ask me about like, hey, do you airbrush dust first? Usually I don't because I tend to, to default to this process, but it's, it's also probably not the most applicable, say for Aircraft might have a slightly different look, so maybe this a little bit too textural for, for aircraft. It just depends, but more or less for ground vehicles, this is a really good technique. Okay, did you get a little oil paint on the brush there? Do a little test speckle. Okay, so come in here, got a little dark oil. You can see the speckles go down, really nice. And this would replicate, you know, splashes or just sort of any sort of random grittiness that happens from stuff stuff spinning around and moving around use a hair dryer to see kind of where you're at and you can see those disappeared fairly easily but when you get up close you can see the speckles in the dust so then you just alter your opacity a little bit put a little bit more paint on the brush versus thinner so the next round of speckles are a little bit more uh, opaque And this kind of builds that layering process up. It's actually really fun. It's a really nice little process to use. So I'm put some eyeballs on so I can see what I'm doing. So now I take the same little brush with oils and I can go to some of the speckles. using a darker color i'm just i'm just using a darker tone just to show contrast like i'm not really trying to show you exact exact more of the process and i wouldn't put a, a pin wash or anything all around everything i would just kind of selectively choose pull out a couple of things You know, and what, you, what I've got is I can see the speckles up close. I'll zoom in a little bit more. You can kind of see those little bit of a darker spots like around here. And you can just pick out a few of them, a little bit of direct hit. Dry those off real good. 
So now you can see some of your opacity starting to hold. So you've got translucent, you've got opaque, you've got three or four layers of dust already. And in the course of like three or four minutes, you've got a really nice little dusty surface. Now it's not a surface you're going to want to touch. Understand that like this isn't like you're not going to fix this. You're not going to varnish it. I mean, you're not going to seal it with a varnish or anything of the sort. So this is a type of thing when you get to this point, you're not touching it. And I don't want to hear this whole thing. Well, don't you worry? It's none of that conversation. You guys don't touch this shit because this is how when you weather to a higher level, You've got to start planning this out in terms of all of that. You guys that freak out about this stuff, just understand you're not going to physically be touching that. So you have to plan it out in the process that it's towards the end of something or where it's on a base where you can handle that um, safely so that you're not putting your fingerprints in that. Because no matter what you put on top of that, you will get, um, you know, human <laughs> human weathering and not in the way you want. But you could also keep going. You know, you could you could do some other things you could you could do a little bit. Let's pull the got a little bit of the medium tone, a little bit darker tones here. Because this is super, super matte right now, which is really nice. I can kind of squish that in. And, and I've got some. So when I talked about weathering time, you see how these two little dudes over here are a little bit more opaque. They're kind of cut, they're kind of killed down with a little bit of a fresh, but the translucency of the pigment still shows through. A little bit of a spritz. This is the fixture in the airbrush, which is just paint thinner at this point. So now I've got a little bit of a color shift in there, a little bit more opaque coloring, but I've also kind of knocked down some of these other little spots in here. This one looks a little fresher. These look a little older than some of these other ones are almost invisible. So now you got a real nice thing going on, um, and which is how I did the front of the tiger, which is where you do that. And then if you, you, know, you want something more specific, specific, then you just use a little bit, uh, Just trying to draw kind of that wet stain similar to that how that tiger looked. Just to show you how I do that. And that's just straight oil paint drawn into the pigments directly and you can kind of see what it starts to do. Dry that off, see how it turns out. That gives you a little bit of a kind of a wet stain look. It, it's pretty simple actually, to be truthful. It's, it's a low stress, even though it looks fairly like it would be a little bit risky, it's a pretty low stress um, process. I'm just building up a little bit more opacity in parts of that stain a little bit. This is just having a good time. <laughs> So that would be how I basically replicated um, the tiger. And I probably went through five or six applications with the Tiger One. Um, and then there's the process on the, I'll show, I'll show you the M3 Leo 2 as, as well. It's the same general idea. And you can get uh, different colors. I'm just using kind of a, some darker blacks down. I'm kind of treating this as the front of a hole, not the bottom of a hole, but and maybe that's a little on the extreme side, but that's okay. I think it looks pretty cool. <laughs> Stuff will dry pretty quick. So one of the beauties of this technique that I like is because of the way that the pigments absorb stuff and how the oils are translucent, how the pigments are translucent, you're building up really translucent layer upon layer upon layer. So you get all these kind of layers of opacity and, and versus the translucent stuff. And so you get a real interesting mix and blend and that's where the realism really starts to come out. So I do appreciate that process. So Mike, there you go, Mr. Mike in the chat. That's kind of the basic rundown of, of, of doing those kinds of things. I think it's pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> Varnishes have uses. This is not the time or place. Yep. That's a good one. That's very true, John. The band varnish. Yeah, no, not that bad, but Hey, Marino, how are you? Oops, hit the camera. Uh, it's speckling on the side of the typhoon and post pick soon. Sweet. Yeah, your typhoon's coming out nice, Al. I'm sure you're having a good time with it. Put that over there. Oh, that's the oil one. Put this guy there. Okay. Down and dirty. Super simple. And that's the key to it is just go layer by layer by layer by layer. Just do a couple layers of dust, fix it, whatever. Speckle it. Do the stuff. Do a couple stains. 
um, add some more dust if you need it, whatever. And that's how you build up the opacity. I would say in, in the in the, the heady days of when I was doing that a lot, uh, you can go as high as six, seven, eight layers of dust if you want. You know, it's not a big deal, to be truthful. It, there's no right or wrong. It doesn't have to be three layers. It doesn't have to be five. It does. It's just whatever's whatever's necessary to. Uh, it's the same. It's the same idea. What I did up here in this picture. Um, it's the same basic idea of all that dust and that speckles here. It's, it's just less layers, so to speak. And you just adjust because this is the top of a tank. It's not going to get as dirty as the side or the front of a tank. So you just do less layers of it, and that's how you handle that. If it just depends on on. Tank Art 1. No, I want two. I was like, why is there German Chef in Tank Art 2? Because we want this one. <laughs> we want this guy. So the M3 Lee uh, was a heavy dust project for me in terms of what you're doing here. And so it's this guy here. And I discussed what I just showed you in this in this series of pages right here. Um, but it's this, it's the front of the, the M3 Lee. It's all this stuff in here. It's the same exact. You just saw exactly how I did that multiple layers of the pigments uh, and then you get kind of that that interesting discoloration because of the translucency and when i talk about too um with the pigments in particular one of the advantages of putting uh, in these little you know containers in this manner it doesn't have to be a, this container specifically but i like the 35 mil containers because the little the lids are airtight they're a good size they hold enough for use over time uh, but at the same token, what's happening is because there's five or six different colors in that, when, when people ask about that versus like, how does it look? It's, the, it's when you get that subtle discolorations between all the different colors, it does show up like that where you quickly can see, you know, you're getting a lot of nice little interesting discolorations in there, you know, plus the color of the base model coming through. So that's that's what that is, my friends. Yeah, it, just use it anywhere you want, Dimitri, anywhere you want dust. Okay, so let's see here. All right, Mr. Choo Choo. <laughs> uh, we're gonna switch to some oils. Put this guy over here. Uh, let's see here. That's been, that's that oil palette's probably, what time is it? 12, almost 1 p.m. Oh, three hours. That's pretty good. You can see that's what they're doing. Put the little tape down. I, I am not a fan of this tape, but it actually works okay. Stop worrying about how current it is. It just yeah, exactly. That's the way you play that. And that'll put your head in the right mental state. So, which is a good idea. And that happens a lot of times, especially with, with vehicles that just don't have a lot of information to work off of, whether it's new or whether it's old. You have to kind of sometimes just put your head in the mindset of, of, of where it's gonna go. Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm building an IDF APC. Yeah, exactly. That'd be a good. The dust on top of that Israeli uh, gray green color uh, is very effective. Same idea. And you just shift your tones of dust according to the region, your project. Again, I was just showing you pure technique with that one. Um, so you can kind of if it's Vietnam, it works. It works for any type of dust application. So you guys are going to have to just you know put your head, your hats on and if you need to figure out what color you want to use for whatever you're using. OK, so I'm just setting this up for you guys. We've got some here. Oh, I do need another side of tape. One more piece of tape. I mean, what was the end of this guy? Okay. One more piece of tape. Uh, but yeah. That should be the whole demo. I should just go watch football. <laughs> that's it. Because <laughs> that right there is actually, believe it or not, that's a, actually a fairly powerful little demo I just did. Because dust is so applicable uh, to so many different things. Uh, yeah, you could shift your colors to snow and whitewashes too as well. Any kind of light pigment application where you want to build it up. What really was going on with that was uh, it, it is a direct correlation to airbrushing thin layers down for tones and for whatever certain effects using your tones. Whether it's um, you could probably get away with even an aircraft exhaust in a very specific scenario. Uh, I haven't done it per se, but I would imagine it, it could pro potentially say the side of a Sky Raider or something that has a really noticeable exhaust stain on the side. You might even be able to get away with that too, in terms of getting that kind of sooty and, and, and apply certain things. I haven't really, and it was something I do want to do in the future. And, and so don't hold me to it, but I will I will say that it, it could be applicable for, for a great many things. But it was really the, the theory of 
versus airbrushing paint, how do I get something more gritty, more textural, more less perfect? Because airbrushing kind of gives you that real perfect look to certain dusting applications. That's one of the reasons I'm not a fan of it. But it was popular back in the early 2000s because pigments weren't around. Pastels were, were the opacity of a pastel, you know, where you had to grind a an art pastel and grind it up on sandpaper, then apply it to a model. The opacity is nowhere near what a pigment can provide. So back in the day, a lot of airbrushing was going on and it still is useful. It has its place for sure. But I just personally, I was like, I want something grittier. I wasn't when you do the OPR over like airbrush dust, it doesn't react the same way. Whereas with the dust pigments, because it's kind of a dirt almost, it reacts kind of how dirt acts, which is what I was looking for. So that's kind of how that worked. Has anyone tried starting off rust with transparent red enamel? No, but you're just laying down tones. So, you know, it just depends on, on uh, Sylvain, how are you? But you're just trying to probably build up um the rust colors to trans now transparent red is gonna be a really pure color though so it depends on what's underneath it if you're, if you're doing this over an orange or a yellow or something else but if you're gonna put red over a white or like you're gonna see it as red so um but because it's a solvent based paint as enamel like you're talking about you can you can do stuff with the thinners that kind of work with it uh i don't know how to say your first name so leps Lep lepstra i apologize this this, this, I don't know how to say your name, but uh, I appreciate you coming after just building painting models for years. I finally started trying weathering in your books. Oh, very welcome. Um, how do you know when to stop with the dusting of the model? You have to use your references, Dimitri. You know, you have to, that's, that's constantly what I'm talking about. You have to look at the real world and to figure out where you're going. You need to have an end game target. What you don't want to do, and I think what a lot of guys do, just because you enjoy the process, you just sit down and do it. But you've really got to, if you're doing this for real, you want to have an end game photos some sort of like hey this is what it looks like and then you build up to that look and that's how you kind of judge yourself okay well this looks pretty close to what i'm seeing so that's kind of like for example none of this happens in a vacuum and i think i think if you guys think you know top level work happens most of the guys that you follow or you guys are interested in they put a ton of work into the reference side of things and that's a it's a critical element and you have to develop your reference portfolio whether it's whether whether it's tanks or planes or there was a really good photo in this Stug book that had, Let's see if I can find it real quick. It was a kind of a top down dusty photo. But what you're going to do is you're really going to balance everything through, through the references. So you have to continually uh, go back. Here you go. I did find it. Actually, the page is loose because the book is falling apart. <laughs> um, so what I'm doing is, is that was a, that was a Stug. But basically, you know, you're looking at your dust, you're looking at your opacity, you're seeing the colorways through there. And you can judge from that. And, you know, you can see how dusty and dirty this engine deck is on the back. Or even driving with the engine hatches open. It's probably so hot and dusty wherever they're at. Um, but this this is opaque dust almost. That's really solid dust because you can tell the, the through the weather, through what they look like, where they're at, how clean this is up over here, all those things. So this is why references are so crucial because this gives you the information so that when you do it for real on the front of your tank or the side of your stuff, whatever it is you're doing, it's that's how you do that. Like, I'm just not shitting dust out just to throw dust down. I was showing you the technique, but to learn this stuff, really, like the next level, you have to match it to what you're looking at in the real world, whatever that is. So that's going to be on you. But that's that's part of this process. Like, you can't do that stuff without those kind of things. You young guys don't know how good you got to spend the entire work session. Yeah, that's the thing. I have not ground up pastels in 20 years. That's probably the, you know, to me, I think, I think one of the smarter, when we talk about gimmicky stuff, um, the pigment question was really an important uh, introduction to the hobby, the skill model hobby as a whole. Um, you're welcome, Brian. He sees uh, happy for the streams. Uh, yep. Uh, does that train have windshield? It does. It does. The, the, they're over here. I meant to actually, where are those little things? I saw them the other day. I took them out so I could paint the shell. They do. There's little glass. I had masked them off. And then I'm like, the the red, the shell pops off. And I'm like, oh, I could take the glass out, which is way easier to work with. I'll put those back in pretty soon uh, in terms of all that stuff. So I think uh, I was asked about red. This is a great idea of why you need red paint on your... on your Because <laughs> if you do red, you need red. But yeah, I remember the days of grinding pastels. It is a messy, awful process because uh, it's just, it's all over the, it's all over. Same with charcoal. I learned how to draw with charcoal. 
charcoal sticks and stuff where you grind them out and you, you, you all sorts of charcoal painting, charcoal drawings and stuff. That's just the messiest of the messiest. Um, yeah, doing good, but busy. Yeah, we all are. It's yeah, this it's start of fall. Summer's over. Uh, Joshua Schickles, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you doing? I'm fixing uh, to order some books. Okay, from your site, they're, they're ready now and there will be a wait. There is a wait on anything that says pre-order. But they're coming in the schedules up listed on the website for everyone to do and if you just it's whatever whatever preference you want to buy them you're welcome to uh, but we did turn off the, the sales are over the summer sale is over so everything is full price now so you will have to pay uh full price uh, and that's because i need to make some money so i can print all dozen books coming this year yeah well i'd say we probably get at least 10 of them out for sure um, she'll be talking to the printer in the morning What's today, Sunday. So I'll talk to her actually tonight. Um, she's in Europe, so I'll, it'll be her Monday morning here at the end of my evening here. Um, past, pastel and vellum, good old days. I loved it. I actually, there was, that's how I learned when you learn about like spraying varnishes and what that is all about and how you fix stuff and fixing pigments. To me, my training is pastel on vellum, uh, marker on vellum drawings. That's how I learned how to pencil. Uh, all that stuff and then how you spray fix it down and how you seal all that up and and yeah it's it's a thing um but yeah the glass is out Zal. so yeah uh but what else we got all right okay shifting gears literally for me so i have to get in my train mode here and what i'm going to be doing here and one of the reasons i decided to get back to this because it's a really good conversation of we've got this work over here this work down here uh, i had done a little bit more work from the last few episodes of this if you guys recall we had put the oils down on this um, and if you're not familiar with what i'm doing this is a pre-painted railroad model uh, that i put a um a flat coat over and then i'm just straight up i did spray the pink paint to fade that out and then we put some oils and stuff to weather up the train same basic process i've been using for all the streams almost I keep trying to I keep running out of creative titles for the stream. So I'm just going super generic, stupid, basic titles for the streams, which I think are kind of funny. Like, I don't have anything catchy or cool to say. It's just, you know, just weathering, my friends. But we're going to be painting some new stuff pretty soon. We're almost done with these projects. And that's how I think is going to the best way to show this is is run these out uh, in terms of the stream and then get the weathering through. And then, like, I'll do the whole weathering on this whole side. Like, we've got most of it done. So we'll do all this over here and then we'll switch back to the Stug. Uh, I'm going to do the top hatches today in the Stug, I think, on the commander's hatches because it'll show you a nice progression of going more vertical on, a, on an armor. Um, and that'll be the bulk of it. If we have time, I'll get to more of the weapons from the Gundam stuff, but we'll see how it goes. I got the pigments out of the way, so I don't have to worry about getting the, the workplace dirty. It's it's fine. Police are out there doing their thing. Okay, I got my oil brushes over here. Let me grab some blenders. Uh, I, do, I did hear the King Art... <laughs> They're sold out again. Sorry. <laughs> Not my fault. Because you guys are the ones buying it all up. So links are in the description down below. It's the King Art Original Gold, the 9020-2s, the max round. Um, it's these guys right here. The red ones, the, the red stripe low Cornells are out of production, but it's actually the same company has restarted it up. So the gold ones are just the new versions of the red stripe. Basically what it is. Okay. So what I've got here, whoops, I'm out of focus, number one, is the colorway here was a lot more in the in the kind of rusty tones, but when you study the rail stuff uh, in particular, uh, it's kind of how the, the dust combines with kind of the leaky fluids, whether it's oil, grease, grime, whatever that be. I've noticed over as I study this stuff, this kind of the colorway, it, it, it looks rusty, but it's kind of just similar colors to rust. It's not really rust. There's rust up here that I've done and we can do, we can pull some more. I'll show you how I do that. Um, it turned out pretty cool actually. But as I've talked about uh, repeatedly, cause I do want to hammer it home a little bit is the light to dark process. It doesn't matter what your subject is. You're going to find that it's going to be a, a fairly safe, repeatable, um successful you know whatever your goal is so to speak going from a light color to a darker range of colors let me zoom out real quick so what i'll showcase here is and you won't see the palette on stream i've got my towel over my lap just in case i drop something on a room of pants so the color the color palette over here so these colors up here are the ones i'll be using for the for the actual tones if i get into that and then i've got all my dust oil grease grime colors over here 
Um, you've got in this particular case, this yellow ochre color will come in handy because now it's got kind of that same kind of yellowy tone to it. You've got the dust tones here, and then we'll build up the darker tones on top of that. So it's a real simple process. Talked about it many times. It's just kind of a refresh for it, but also at the same time, uh, it's always good to kind of just go back through this with you guys in terms of switching gears because there's a lot of fans of this versus the tanks versus um, planes and trains and all plane tanks, planes, trains, automobiles, whatever it is. Make sure I'm not in the oil palette there. And if the glare is too much from the outside light, I can close that window a little bit up if I have to. So anyway, light to dark. Just give me some oil color, some thinner, some paint. Pretty straight up simple process, low stress, work small. That way if any mistakes happen, there's nothing, nothing majors happen. So I'll start down on the, the trucks or what these are called trucks where the wheels are uh, in real terminology. It's called a truck. And what I'll do is I'll start with uh, some coloring down here first. Just putting some dust down. Make sure the angle's good. Try to get you a good viewing angle for your viewing pleasure between games. Yeah, I don't know who all watched the, the Italian Grand Prix this morning at Monza. It was very interesting. So this is just a simple, this is what you've seen in multiple times now where I just put a little bit of a light, kind of a wetter application of dust down with the oils. I'll move this along fairly quickly today. Usually I would work like half of this and then half of this, but I'm gonna work this whole thing as kind of one unit today. A little quicker. The beauty of this and the, the things of this nature is the verticality. That's a vertical surface. So the streaking, the vertical streaking is gonna actually make it real easy to do this. So I switch the, the red one will be the blender. So if I don't mention that I switched to the blender, that's what that's what you're seeing. The gold ones will be the color. I'm trying to keep that fairly um, common across the streams now. And that's because I have a lot of these red ones left in my stash. I'm going to just use them up over time. It'll take a couple of years, but they're very good brushes. So there's no point not to, right? Because <laughs> I own them. Yeah, hopefully I'll be talking to King Art next week about some things. That would be nice. Have a conversation. Because my boys keep buying up all your brushes, my friends. So let's figure this out. That would be nice. And then what I've got over here, just so you can see, it'll be a little bit off camera, but this, this pair of trucks here, I referenced myself for that. So part of this process, once you get past the initial early stages of weathering a model and you stop and start, stop and start is using your previous work as your guide. And that's what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just kind of glancing to the left, seeing what I've got going on. I quick study some, some train picks this morning, although I do study train picks almost daily now. <laughs> so I do save them on my Instagram account and stuff like that. And if you guys aren't familiar how Instagram works, you can click and save a photo on the back side, you can create a collection of all different folders of, of different subject matter, and you can just you can just save the collection, save the collection, and just whatever. I have a train one. Just put all these train photos that I find, and there's a ton of them on the on the Instagram. Same with the armor and other stuff, aircraft and other things. I always just have a constant reference. So that goes back to Dimitri's comment: of How do you know when it's going? A lot of it is because of of, of collecting the reference and, and always having that available. It is a fairly handy part. I like it way more than Facebook does it, to be truthful with photo saving and all that stuff. I'm not a big fan of how Facebook is algorithmed out with that. Okay, so let's actually, let me dry that real quick. So do a little hair dryer. Since it's a more of a wet application, there's a little bit more thinner on there. Uh, I'm just kind of kicking it down a little bit because I'm going to start layering up the darker tones now, light to dark. Because if you, if you continually work with a lot of thinner on the surface, it just turns muddy. So I've, so I've dried that a bit just to give me a little bit more um, ability to blend some other colors on top. 
So now I'm going to switch to more of a darker medium brown tones with a little bit of this kind of yellowy orange color to it. So it's not really a rust tone, but it's in that kind of family of, of this over here on, on this kind of stuff. And again, I'm picking up these colors from what I'm seeing in the photos and I'm not a railroad expert, so I'm not sure entirely why the colors are the way they are. It could be the mix of the earth with kind of kind of the oils and solvents that are working on trains and what's going on and, and creating kind of that tone to it. Maybe there's some bleeding surface rust as well, possibly into that. So it could be a few things. Uh, again, I'm not an expert as to what's creating that colorway. It is unique though. So which, which makes it fun for us. And I look for stuff like that too. When I'm looking at references and especially color photos of, of more modern stuff, is I'm looking for contrast. I think one of the key elements to success is really, and I think Zal, you're probably seeing it with your Typhoon and stuff, is really you're working towards a contrast level where visually you have differences between the base colors, the earth colors. Uh, when they're very, very similar across the whole thing, that's when the, the, there's a low contrast. It's oftentimes not as visually interesting. So, and that's why the light to dark process is something that I like to discuss is because you're building up that, that visual contrast. Just putting some initial semi-translucent kind of medium brown tone, realistic kind of streaks in there. They're still a little bit thinner from the dust from before, so I can go more paint now, less thinner. So my color brush doesn't have a lot of thinner on it. And if I go a little too dark too fast, I just pull out the blending brush. I kick some of these down a little bit. My little, my little Jimmy Jeans. It's really low key, real easy stuff to just kind of work your way through this room. So you can kind of see, kind of in the shadows there. And I actually enjoy building up the stuff this way versus kind of, and it goes back to the conversations we were having in previous streams about traditional methods versus this process with OPR and what I've kind of really talked about in terms of applying stuff. See, right now I'm kind of going through a pin wash application on these, on this uh, detail over here with a lot of bolts and, and little stuff, but I'm not really putting a pin wash over the whole thing. Um, and it's just by building stuff up this way, I kind of build the story I get a really good feel for how this is starting to look. So as the artist, I'm kind of like coming through and okay, well, that's, that's what, that's looking good. I like that. Uh, I can kind of see, well, I'm going to need to pump up even more dark, greasy tones into that. So that's what's going through my head as I'm doing this. I'm just building up some color on the brush right now. Oops, picked up a lot of oil. There's a little bit too much thinner on that. So I'm going to dry this down a little bit. It wasn't transferring. You can see the glossiness on there. That means there's a little too much thinner. So the hairdryer will evaporate this out because it makes it a little bit more workable. The trick and the trick to OPR is less thinner is better. You don't want to be working with a lot of uh, wet, wet applications. It's just, it just turns into mud too fast. Yeah. And that's a good, good idea Zal. That's exactly what I'm doing is I'm building up the contrast. Um, I'm doing a little bit more on the fly because my experience plays into where I know I need to pump up some of the darker tones. So you're probably as you as you're learning this a little bit at the same time, you're 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 probably a little bit more conservative. So as you get more experience, your confidence will go up, and then you'll start to instinctively know, okay, well I can punch this up. I can I can this is fine. That's good. I need to go more contrast here, and that's kind of how this starts to play as you move into model four, five, six through a dozen of these over the course of time. And sometimes too, you get you get paint in the belly versus the tip. So what, what was happening right there was was the paint, I've, I've got it wiped into the belly of the brush and I have to pull it into the tip. 
so that it actually transfers off of the tip, which is what was I was fighting at there for a second. So these would be little, little kind of little subtle things that happen with the brush as you as you work uh, work through it. And I know when I look at my the stuff over here to the left, we even have a, a, an ultimate black layer in the middle. So I'm not super concerned if I'm not going quite dark enough just yet, because I know we'll, we'll punch this up even more. By having the, the light and middle tones down first, I'm able to, if you go too dark too fast with this stuff, because even though this is a really quick little process right here, you still want to go through the steps because that, that maintains your control. Because what you don't want to be with a lot of this stuff is out of control because you just won't get the precise results. So you can see I'm building some real subtle uh, streaking up over in here. Here, try that again. That's why the hair dryer is so crucial. And this is a workflow thing. What you're seeing right now is kind of a general workflow when, when I'm off camera. Uh, I'm trying to show you, show you guys a little bit more of a workflow today. Uh, less less going slow to show you versus more of my natural workflow. If that makes some sense. So that's how I'm build up build up kind of that side. Now I can kind of work back over here and get and get some contrast going up over in here. Kind of a darker pin wash around some of these details. We've already got some dust down. So the, the darker colors kind of blending into the dust oil a little bit, but not too much. I'm not flooding the surface or anything. Put some more ochre. So now I switch and blend that out. And I work. I like working a little bit more instinctively this way versus letting that sit and then coming back at it like 10, 15 minutes later than trying to figure out what to do with it. I think that's another little mental aspect change that that is that has come online with with this process versus putting a solvent based paint down and then letting it sit for a long time because what happens is you kind of also kick out of your mental state a little bit you know where you're, you're not really in a flow and i like i really believe in the fact of you know getting into a rhythm getting into a workflow thing getting into kind of what it is that you're trying to do i'm trying to weather up this guy and I, what i don't want to do is put down paint and then wait 15 minutes to do something with it so that kind of, it does affect your, you know, when you start doing this often, it does affect kind of how you, how you approach it. So it's one of the reasons I like this process a little bit more too, because it does kind of keep you in um, that right kind of mental flow state a little bit. Light over here a little bit more. I might blow out my hat, but that's why I wear the hat. <laughs> Cause I got no hair. So when the light goes over my head like this, Which one was this? That's the dust brush, wrong one. So I've got two main color brushes. I've got kind of a lighter, dustier color. And then I've got one set up for this kind of darker uh, grease grime color right now. So it's a real basic colorway, but it's still a light to dark process. One thing I don't like about that yellow ochre color is it's so old, it does not get on the brush very well. happens what's happening is is the the burnt umber is overpowering the yellow ochre on the brush and i'm not getting any yellow ochre so i have to open the oil up get a little bit more of the yellowy ochre color there it goes and that's just because the oil paint in that tube is getting pretty old and dried up so it's almost pure paint which is fine you just have to work you just have to work with it a little bit more I have to cut that open and You can see the tones on screens a little bit more of a, of a, of a warm 
uh, kind of earthy tone. And that's what that yellow ochre does, kind of a yellowy, warm earth tone. And I was talking about that on the Stug, where the yellow ochre, you have to be careful because it does have a strong yellow tint. In this case, I want that. But on the Stug, on the winter stuff, I didn't. I didn't want that yellow earth tone. So it's not a color I could use as much uh, on the Stug. And that's where you start to learn how the colors, because there's a lot fewer oil colors to work with. You have, uh, you have to start making some, some more strict color decisions on, okay, well, that tone does that, that tone does this. You know, my burnt umber, which is the, the medium brown, dark brown color does this. The raw umber is a more of a black, dark brown, does certain things too, so. I should answer the question, I'm paying attention. Hey, Mark, what I, I missed the whole thing, sorry. <laughs> apologize, I apologize, I'm getting in the flow here. I've been watching too much football this week and I'm trying to actually get my 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 brain focused for you guys. I don't want to be distracted. Too, even though I am, I don't want to be super distracted. But let me catch up with you guys. Seems like a lot of people still use manual transmission in your city. Uh, can you hear people shifting gears outside? <laughs> uh, yeah. No, there's automatic transmissions rule the roost. They're, you, can even, you can't even buy a modern car with a manual transmission, can you? I think Toyota Corolla has one. Uh, some of the off-road, like the Jeeps and the Ford Broncos, have manual transmissions, but I would say most sedans and most SUVs, um, minus the high-end sports cars, all have automatic transmissions at some point. It's one of the, the sadder parts of, of human beings is that we just abandon manual transmissions. Uh, I mean, I get it if you're in traffic a lot, but uh, known as bogies in the UK. Yeah, truck the truck bogies, I think, is technically what the name are, is, is Mark, is their truck bogies. Uh, but trucks are what they shorten up to in, here in the U.S., uh, but on, on armor, it is called a bogey. On rail, it is called a truck. Uh, they do know that much. So there might be some crossover between the UK and the US and how they talk about the train parts. I don't know if Bryn's around. Bryn, what do you guys call them if you're out there? I saw your name earlier. I know you're listening, my friend. Uh, Bachman is pretty old school. Yeah, it is an old Bachman one. Again, uh, this one actually, so I thought Craig Cole, I don't know if Craig's around. Craig's probably busy, busy today. Uh, if, he, if he hasn't said hello. But I did buy this at, on. I bought this Santa Fe one myself. He uh, sent me some other stuff. He sent me the container, the truck container, um, and some other stuff. I just want to make sure I'm catching the questions here and I'll put my head back down and get back to work. But I saw Mark Swegler working with the oils on a helo cockpit at the moment. Base is flat lacquer. Okay. Everything goes smooth so far, except when I use a black brown mix and pin washy consistency, it left some stain. So if you're getting any kind of staining, uh, and I've talked about this before where an oil paint is staining the base color a little bit. Uh, what, you just work with the blending a little bit. Sometimes if, if it happens and you can't fix it, you have to kind of continually paint to kind of repair that. Uh, and you might actually sometimes, if it's really bad and you can't fix it, fix it, like while you're doing it, you can't repair it, uh, just pull out the airbrush and, and you'd be surprised what a little spritz of airbrush will do with, with something like that. I've repaired many things that way. Um, but in future references for stuff, if you're noticing the oil is staining the base paint, uh, I recommend just put a little base thinner down first. In this case, I'll take my blending brush here, get on camera, dude. If not, all right. so on camera. There we go. So take some base thinner. Just lay some thinner down on the surface first. And that kind of like not wet, not soaking wet, but just, you know, just get a little bit of thinner down. I don't know if the light will catch that. Um, wets that surface first. And then that way, when you come back in, and you put your your oil paint down. See that? Well, there's a, it's this has got a lot of thinner, and it's, it's a little actually. I was probably juicing that up, and I wasn't paying attention. That's a little way too wet. And that's a more traditional pin wash. Pro I don't really like how wet process that was. But then you just come in here. I was going to do that up there anyway. So it's so there's a, the surface itself has a little bit of thinner on it, and that'll prevent the staining part of it. Jimmy Jam stipple brush here. Soften that up. So oftentimes, once you once you get kind of things in the flow, it get a little bit of thinner down if it's fighting you a little bit. And like I was, I think I was talking in the reverse of that, like the light colors, especially white, will stain paint quite easily. It's a good idea to get in the habit of, of just laying a little bit of thinner down first before you touch it with the oil. Um, and that's how you treat that. We'll come back up to this guy. But you can see how fast that goes. Look at that beautiful little bit of just grime up there. Get my angle a little bit more. So you can see how quick that goes down. 
but same idea same concept there the mark that'll help you with the, with the staining if you if you're seeing an oil paint do fighting you a little bit on that um it could be a textural element too uh, sometimes when you spray matte paints depending on how it goes um you especially i don't know if the cockpit how you sprayed the cockpit per se you know if it was like the cockpit was built and you're spraying at an angle you might get some orange peel sometimes you'll have a textural element where the oils will play a little bit weird with it this is really smooth so it does work really well sometimes with some textural elements so if you get sandings and stuff like that that's going to be your 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 your, um, your thingy who's drinking you guys drinking uh you want me to drink some water because you're concerned about me two hands because you're such a nice guy <laughs> uh gti golf R, gli all available the man yeah vw has come back around with that but i will tell you this emphatically as a guy who knows my vws pretty well uh the sales of that are less than like five percent i think most of the cars that you're mentioning there all except for maybe the r go out with the tiptronic um the actual true stick transmission they're very rare in terms of percentages on sales it's probably less than one or two percent of total car sales in the u.s for sure uh europeans probably europe and asia probably still drives more with manuals than we do but at least in america it is it is like you can't even you i don't even think you can order audis anymore with a manual anymore at all period um i think when the a3s kind of came and went the hatchbacks uh when the a3 stand came in i think they killed that like i don't even think you can pre because you should be able to european order in an, a manual like on an a3 no i don't know that's why both of my cars are 35 years old and manual transmission. But I don't know. I guess you heard some things, Al. I don't know what you're hearing. Somebody grinding gears out there. Uh, that's funny. The the truck. You're probably hearing the rigs. The, the rigs are all manual for sure. I mean, I know most of the, the the transport trucks. We should do one of these days. I wonder if I if I if I have any gumption left. <laughs> I should go outside one of these days with the stream. I might do edited content with some walking around town because I'm right next to the major rail yard here. So there is some pretty cool stuff. And there is a river right down there with some, some shipping and stuff. Okay. Let me clean up some of this mess down here. That is also the beauty of oil paint, though. If, if I do get distracted and, and kicked off my train of thought here, I can clean this up, tighten this up. I always evaluate my work, demo or not demo. You know, I am critical of myself sometimes. I go, that sucked. I didn't like that. I do try to make sure that the, the next time I show you guys stuff to make to make sure I'm on point. I do want the work to be quality. Yeah, you might have heard a, a big rig downshift. And there's a there's a bridge ramp right there. And these if these rigs come around, the trucks come around. If they're coming in too hot, they have to they have to J break it and, and engine break down. You'll hear that for sure. Especially if the driver is new to the area, he doesn't know that turn right there tightens up pretty hard. Saw a, saw a crazy accident Friday behind me, behind out the window here. I just happened to be getting my coffee and, and sitting down and car. There's a northbound street below me and was going up, and a guy came across the eastbound or the westbound, T-boned him. And he hit him so hard, he kicked him up onto the railing. The car flipped over on its roof. I was like, holy shit. Yeah, there's quite a bit of a mess. Nobody was hurt, though, because the speeds were low enough, thankfully. But yeah, it was pretty pretty scary. Because you don't even, there's no horns. There's no, it just, they just hit. And all you hear is the sound. That's not a pleasant noise, trust me. I know those of you that know what a car wreck sound sounds like, it's not pleasant. And you get a lot of horn honking, too. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm adding some some fairly dark uh, dark browns and almost a black tone. Somebody's honking their horn like crazy out there. I'm intentionally leaving, I'm leaving this guy a little bit clean up in here just to give me some contrast between this. A little bit more of a story play here. There's some minor details in this little section. And I should, I should say too, these were black, they're black plastic. I did airbrush on this light gray tone that I'm working over that I am painting over. So there is, there's no hard and fast rules. Uh, I will say if you guys are doing this kind of stuff, if you are on the, the train side of life or, um, you know, if you have something that has color down already, like if you guys recall this dude here, when we were doing, when I was doing this guy, uh, I sprayed that green on top. It was, it's actually this really dark forest green, kind of a bright foresty blue green. So you can airbrush colors over stuff to get certain tones going at way easier. So I did airbrush in, uh, I think that was mentioned before. 
like that light color is actually i don't know if it's it's actually black yeah, it's actually black underneath so i did airbrush in kind of a light gray tone kind of a concrete color which is pretty nice again just looking at references and seeing what it is and just you know selecting colors that match and as, i know a lot of you guys like to know the color names but it's i couldn't tell you what it used at least not not three weeks later that's you know it's funny because that's how I, that's really how i got started i think i've talked about this that's really how i got started with the books and stuff how i started taking photos was that I, I would always forget what the hell i was doing and then i post stuff on the internet like on the web forms with the with the armor stuff and then you start needing more and more photos to start showing what you're doing and it was just kind of that process like okay i better get good at photography because i'm ocd of course <laughs> So then I start studying photography, which I don't really, I didn't really know anything about, like other than just how to take a general photo, but how to take good product photos and stuff, you know, all that kind of stuff. How to go learn all that. And that was before YouTube was really showing you how to do all these things. I learned a lot with photography, with the actual, the, the, the manuals that come with the cameras, they actually tell you quite a bit. If you guys have good like Nikons or Canons, they have really good. I'm sure all they do, they all do, but they do come with manuals that do t t talk to you about the general basics of, of certain scenarios, of what you need to do. So now I'm just going with kind of my darker tones. We'll wrap up this little piece and I'll start moving up real quick here. blender and it's a good idea to keep cleaning the blender off you want that as usually as clean as possible you'll get muddiness and problems with blending when the blender has actual paint on it too by the way if you haven't discovered that so sometimes that's a little bit of a trial by fire i need to try this it's gonna look too bad the drying is so crucial Matt Bryan, how are you? Another Matthew in the in this group. You guys are talking. Any synthetic brush is more preferable than using open or enamel thinner. Uh, how do you look after brushes after those? Um, I've been using the same brushes for everything, Dimitri. So I don't know how to answer that because I've never really used anything besides synthetics. I don't use sables for anything other than figure painting. Um, and you just clean them, clean them, clean the paint off when you're done. I store them vertically, um, and then occasionally I'll use it. You know. Like here's like, let me just show you. So this is, this is a, hold on, this down. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ruin some things. I'm, this down. I'm assuming Dimitri, you're fairly new to this. Is it, is that the type of questions I'm getting from you? A little bit, you, you're, you're asked, which is fine. Totally, totally cool. So say this is a brush that's been sitting down for a week. What I'll do is just to look, run it through your little bit of saliva, store that vertically so that the, it's down and then bristle up. And that's after it's been cleaned and, and cleaned out and everything. Uh, and that's that'll keep them fairly well. And there are brush cleaners that are available. If you have brushes you want to keep for a long period of time. Synthetics, I don't really worry about it because they're four or five dollars a piece. And then once I use them up, I just buy more. It's usually what I do. Uh, we'll do a photo tutor uh, tutorial. Uh, we, I've done one a little bit here where I've talked a little bit about the base photography stuff. I forget what stream number it was, but it's just the white paper with the card and stuff. But we'll we'll get into the taking pictures. Chris Pabs, how are you, brother? There's a couple a couple of photography lives. Yeah, some dude weird name. Chris Pabs has done a, if you guys uh, check him out, check out his YouTube at Chris Pabs. Uh, he did a scale model. It was with Gundams, but he did a scale model how to take pictures. So it talks about uh, f-stops and shutter speeds and apertures and all sorts of fun stuff. It can be complicated, but once you kind of get your feet grounded under with, with photo taking, it goes pretty straightforward. But I'll also, um, combine that a little bit. And I have to figure out how to do that with the share of the screens. Uh, I'll combine it a little bit with Photoshop because I'll show you how I clean up a photo for, for printing as well. So you or for also for Instagram and, and Facebook too, because there is a little bit of post edit on some of the pictures to get the white looking white. Um, Matt says he bought Tinkart 4, loving it so far. Looking forward to your name. Thank you, Matt. That's awesome. Appreciate that. As I was gonna say, your name did sound familiar. I probably saw that order come through. All right, Wayne, good luck, brother. If, if, you, if you have both of them on and you're watching whom, whomever, it'll be interesting to see how Mac Jones does today. 
Scott, how are you? Plastic Posse, how you doing, brother? Good to see you. I've got my my tank raft mat down today just for you. It's underneath here, I promise. Um, uh, but yeah, so to Dimitri, to your question on oil paint and enamel, they're both solvent based. So they, the oils and enamels kind of will do the same thing to a brush, more or less. They'll, they'll basically beat the shit out of it. Uh, I am using, though, to to remind you guys, especially like if you're new to this, I use an odorless thinner. I do not use white spirits or enamel thinners with the OPR process. It is it is too caustic of a, and hot of a thinner. It does not blend the same, and you will notice it. Uh, send me a message, Mike. I'll help you out with the setup. Oh, you got it, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, it's one of the harder things I've, I've with StreamYard is with when I've got three or four screens going because I've got the Spotify, my face, the model, and then like a Photoshop screen, all that. It gets a little... Yeah, it's just me. I think you got some more. Yeah, I think you do too, Marie. Plastic pasta. Yeah, yeah. I just, I didn't want to... <laughs> yeah. Get on that, Dimitri. Get on it. But some of the questions aren't all answered in there anyway. But that is, you know, the brush cleaning one comes up on occasion. Um, but these brushes, the way I use them in this particular context, this is all I really use them for. Is the OPR. Uh, anything I use to paint stowage or figures. They're just separate group of brushes, and some of them are the same. These number twos do a lot of good double duty, but I do have sables, and I just take really good care of them, and, and I use them for real high precision painting on occasion when I do it. It's not often, but it does happen. Okay, so we've got, let's go a little bit light to dark again. So looking at my colorway over here, this is I'm looking up over here, over here, kind of that, that ochre It's not really dust at this point in time, because as, as the rails move up, these are huge machines um they're not as dusty dusty up above the trucks and stuff so i can go a little bit more of, a, of an ochre color which is kind of a yellowy rust color what you, yellow ochres it's yellow ochres yellow ochre <laughs> like that is a descriptive term of what that is okay, there's a little bit more, so you can see there's a little bit of a ledge here A little bit of a wet application. You can see that tone. See how it's kind of that yellow. It's kind of like baby poop brown, but a little bit lighter. Like if it's got diarrhea, it's not a it's not a pretty color. It's not my favorite. Maybe that was too descriptive for some of your parents. But that's kind of. Then I just draw through the details. There will be some capillary action through the through the panel lines and on, on these little. Uh, Everything behind, if you don't know what this is, this is, these are actually all the engine doors. This whole thing's an engine. That's a giant motor, maybe. How many are in there? Maybe one or two? Sometimes there's two or three motors in here. This is, uh, there's a giant motor behind these doors and all these panel doors open for maintenance. That's actually what this is. Because an actual, a train engine, the whole compartment here is a motor. Big dog motor. Does a lot of hard work. I'm putting a little bit more pure paint over the red Santa Fe letters. A little bit less thinner, a little bit more of a pure paint. Kind of, you can see how I've left the upper part of the A a little bit uh, more pure red. I'll do the same thing a little bit through through the letters a little bit. I've got it a little bit on the S over here, a little bit reversed. Kind of do that on the E over here too. This kind of fades the, the red out a little bit. And what I can do if I wanted to, take a little bit of the pink oil as well, pink oil paint. Doesn't look a ton different, but it is actually a shade different. So take my blender brush because there's, there's a fair amount of thinner on that already. Almost pure. Probably use my, my little stipply dude. This guy here's a good one too. I have to get in the right position. It's there's a it's a awkward angle between the camera, the brush, and everything else. So I'm just stippling that what I'm doing is I'm softening that upper edge of that color I applied. There's almost no thinner involved. See how it's starting to, to soften that up? I'll clean up anything that goes outside of the red and we'll come down here and just stipple directly over that. Just 
and I'm actually pushing this straight into the paint. There's no jiggity jiggity, there's no caffeine shake, there's no nothing. It's just a straight tapping stipple. And it's almost a dry blender. And this is kind of a cloudy effect that you can get uh, with this with this kind of a application. Because I want that color to stay, but I want it to soften it up a little bit. Like, can you see how specific I stippled that? Yeah, that actually turned out pretty good. That's a that's a workable. So that's one way to fade something this specific. Now, if I was really intense and I really want to get crazy and mass all that off so that the red, I could actually airbrush in some fading if I wanted to. But when you when you're kind of in this position where I don't like I'm not taking it that far per se, but how do I still fade the paint with the oils and, and just using this OPR palette? That's how you do that. So it's another option, if you will, if that makes sense. And so I've left the color break off the off the doors. So I'm using what I'm in. So so what's happening here in my head is as I've studied the references of stuff like this already for the past you know six months of trains and everything going on. So I'm I'm learning how when like these doors will open up. It's the same thing as the engine deck doors on the Stug we did last week, where some of these panels I'm leaving. Okay, well I'm gonna leave this one a little cleaner here. Cause that's maybe that's the one where the, where the mechanic or the engineers are working on this stuff. And that's, you know, those kind of ideas where I'm playing up um, the back and forth between the human, the human weathering is, as you can call it, because they, the crew affect quite a bit of these things. Okay. Thank you, Brandon. There you go. One engine with electrical alternator generated to power the traction motors in the trucks. There you go, my friend. Brandon, the train mechanic in the crew. Appreciate that. Thank you. So I've got a little bit of like a darker, greasier red. I'm just kind of dry brushing that. There's almost no thinner on this brush. So this would be the edge of that door right there. And that kind of kicks that back, just showing that as kind of a weathered element over the faded pinky red color, pinkish red color. And that's before there's a panel line drawn into that. So I'm doing the weathering first in terms of the paint fading on this on this particular letter. I'm being real specific right now. I, I've, I've laid down some colors here that I'm fine with how it looks. In fact, I could probably do a little blend um, just to kind of, yeah, there's a, yeah, you can see on camera right below the T there. So let's just clean this up. Just a little bit of vertical streaking off the top of that. Kind of wipe that up pretty good. There's a little bit over here. Actually, I can see it better. The camera angle is perfect to see the actual top of that oil color there. So again, light to dark. All I've applied in here so far is that lighter tone. I haven't applied any of the darker tones we're seeing over here. It looks like, yeah, there is a little bit of yeah, interesting little stain. I did some other stuff in there. Clean this up because that, that was a little clumsy under there from earlier. But since it's applied today, I still got enough ability to clean that up there's a little bit of an overhang right there. Kind of coming to be a little bit more specific, tidying up my previous application. A little bit of a messiness on the top of the edge of that door, so let's be a little bit more precise, clean that up. I will say that is one of the, one of the things with, with doing demo work is I have to be a lot more conscious of what I've applied and then because I'll start talking and forget what I did. <laughs> and then I'd like, oh shit, I didn't do that, finish that or whatever. You know? So there's kind of the, the lighter part of that. But you can see how we've treated that E already and it's got kind of a nice little bit of a, a start to it. The F has a little bit going to A2, does have a little bit of the same idea. So I'm using the panel breaks and the surface detailing to create the roadmap or it is did the roadmap for me to create the weathering from. So I'm using the details on the surface in the same way I talk about it with the hairspray chipping with, with the chips and scratches give you kind of that roadmap. That's exactly what I'm doing here. And the same thing when I did on the on down below too, is just, I'm just using the details to kind of guide my way through because I know where certain things are going to happen. Like the grease of the leaky hubs is going to be a little bit darker. Or, you know, this panel is going to open up. So the paint's going to be a little bit darker because that's where the human interact with it. 
And that's usually what happens. The paint will fade and then they'll interact with it and they'll get a little bit darker. And just to, to reaffirm that to you guys, because we just saw that. It's the same basic general principle. Okay, trying to get the pixelation of the photos, but you see around his shoulder is, is kind of a, around the biceps right in here. It's all of this is because his clothes and hands and everything else, all that darkening comes like up in here, all comes from the crew. And it's the same idea that I'm applying here, same concept. So that's using references to control your weathering and really start telling that story. Let me catch up with you fellas. Uh, should be you too, Mr. Pabs, what are you doing? How are you, Chris? Uh, I am excited that, uh, Craig Cole, I see you there. One giant engine, one big motor, one big ass motor. Uh, good to see you guys in Forest Ghost. Hello. Um, that is the that plastic posse is Mr. Scott Gentry, the man, the myth, Mr. Utah. Watched Utah versus BYU last night. That was a good football game. BYU finally beat the Utes for the first time in 10 years. Um, let's see what else. Did I get any, miss any questions? Yeah, at, at Chris Pabs is at Chris Pabs. All his all his socials. He's one of the um, premier American uh, Gundam painters. Uh, doesn't do a ton of weathering because the little dude just, uh, you know, I got to teach him a whole bunch of stuff, but the man can F and paint. Let me tell you, <laughs> the boy can paint uh, and he likes purple. It's his favorite color. I love the Chris. I'm excited for that Apex kit. I, I, I can't wait to get a hold of one of those little buggers when they come out. I'm, I'm glad that Adam's doing all that. Uh, a nice deal is mixing doors between, yeah, locals. That, that's actually what I was thinking about. I, I was, I did that on the, on the, um, let's back over there. Uh, but mix matching doors, I, I saw a couple rigs outside. I took some pictures of over the weekend where the back of the, the containers of the 40 footers or the different doors and stuff. So uh, that's one of the more enjoyable things to do is, is to mix and match doors. Say they, they popped off doors and replaced it or one door got cooked from the heat of the motor. They put on another door, or, you know, whatever however you guys do stuff. Because, you know, um, that's the better part of storytelling. Two hands, I was going to watch that game. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you were. I'm sure that was on your list of, of list of college games to watch on a Monday, right? It was the Utah BYU game. Yeah. Because what, you're Mormon or something? <laughs> That's funny. That's a good one. Um, yeah, so everybody cool. Then you do it with the car shops. Guys get bored. <laughs> is that what that is? Okay. Yeah. That is why they call them engines. That you're funny, though. Okay. Everybody cool. Okay, back to work, Michael. Okay, but doing some nice little bits here on the weathering. You can see, let me zoom out a little bit for you guys. Let's do a quick little recap. So you can see now where we've got um, the work we did over here, earlier work, and then I've got a, a good base work over here. Uh, I'm moving the stream along a little bit. I could probably spend two or three hours just OPR weathering the truck here on this side, just completely just go crazy with it. What I tend to do is just do enough for you guys to get the process down. And then what I'll do on my own time is kind of just tighten that up a little bit. Uh, and that's what I did over here. Um, you know what we can do? Do I have? Uh, oh, I don't. I'd have to go pull out. We'll we'll do it another stream. I was going to show you the black pigments and the oil again, but we can do that another stream. What? You know what? Let's do it. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You guys are so pushy. Oops. It is crowded over here. Uh, let's see here. Look at this guy. Okay. So a really cool idea. Just another quick kind of refresher recapper. It's very effective for a great mini a joint an, uh, a knee joint or a leaky uh, ankle joint on a Gundam, the greasy, grimy trucks of a train, um, the wheel hub of a tank. So let's take some pigments. We have some oils here. Let me zoom in a little bit tighter for you guys. That's as close as it'll go. I move that up a little bit. OK, this is fun. I enjoy this process right here. So let me re-wet. Uh, let me get the eyeballs back on. Let's rewet some stuff here. Okay, so let me put down. I'm gonna put down kind of a oh, whoops, wrong, wrong thingy. I'm gonna put down a little bit more of a wet application of dark brown. Kind of dirty, greasy dirt color. Get a little bit more. It's a bit a little bit more of your classic wash. Okay, so I'm gonna take my dark pigments. 
little tiny brush, dude. It's a little tiny. This is when it, this is when I keep these little brushes. This is a two O. I got five O's and ten O's and all sorts of tiny little brushes I just have that I don't really use. Use. Come on, get it. Oh, oh, duh. No wonder this is this is an old glue brush. Hold on, let me switch brushes. There you go. I need a little bit softer. I was like, why is it not picking any pigment up? That's because it's like a super glue brush. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay, pigment on the brush. Let's put that. Put that right down in the wet oil. So this is that kind of cakey, greasy, repeated were over time. When we talk about weathering time and all that kind of stuff. Come back in here with my oil, with the color on it. I'm gonna go a little bit more of the black tone of the oil paint. Let me cut this brush a little better. Now I've come back over and I'm gonna put the fresh, dark, greasy oil color. It's a little bit more black in the oil paint into that pigment that I've just put down. And the thinner from the oil paint will act as a fixer for the pigments. But the um, pigments will give you that, that cakey texture, if you will. One wet, juicy hub seal there that is not looking good, my friends. It's having a bad day. Kind of cleaning up a little bit of it around here. Gonna hit the hair dryer with this guy. That's starting to dry. And when you look up close to this, it's got a real thick opacity to it. So that's about 75% dry for right now. I'm going to do a little bit more artiste work with it, the blender. Pull through a few more streaks through that. Just trying to. step and you can see up here too this is all kind of dry and looking pretty good too which means we can put the pigment brush down so we don't screw anything up okay that's pretty black let's cut this brush back down to a brown color brown rusty color let that air dry for a little bit longer let it kind of i just want to see how it does air dry and how how glossy juicy that stays because then I'm gonna pull in some uh, another little trick of the trade here for a second. Trick of the trains, my friends. Trick of the trains. Okay, so now I'm just real carefully doing a little bit of panel lining on this. I like to go real slow. I like to kind of control this this effect myself. I do some capillary action, not a not a lot, a lot. It's just kind of drawing up a little bit. Go ahead and clean this up immediately. Like I don't like to let this stuff sit around and wait myself. Kind of like the idea of, of kind of controlling it and getting it 
kind of finalize as they go. And that's why we put, that's also why we put the light down first because we've got the faded F in there and then we've got a little bit of that panel lined uh, hinges and hatches and stuff that the, these, these little hinge guys here. Again, it's a very repeatable, very successful little process of going light to dark with this stuff. Very controllable. And if I was to, to get real sloppy with that and start slopping that all around, you're gonna push all that dust oil down that you put down earlier and just cause yourself a whole bunch of headaches. So by doing it real precise like this, uh, you're gonna have a lot better result. <laughs> Didn't finish my sentence there. I got sidetracked by the, that stain wasn't uh, blended out nicely enough. The camera angle I've got is actually perfect for the silver, it's showing up the details even more than, than my eye than my view my eyeballs I can clean up some of that faded paint over here a little bit so it's even tighter and that's how you can control that you can you can get really precise with that by just kind of cleaning up any overflow with a clean brush not wiping some of that away and that'll kind of that cleans up that a little bit what else is going on? I have to figure out how to use Instagram. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Get yourself on Instagram. It's a pretty, it's a pretty useful app uh, tool to be honest with you. Instagram can be really powerful in, in, a, in a good way, you know, because you can stay anonymous. You don't have to involve yourself with anything if you're not interested in that stuff. But at the same time, you have access to by viewing certain subject matter you'll get a, a, a really fresh, it is one of the better algorithms for like, if you like trains, for example, it'll show you a lot of trains. Once it starts learning that you like the trains, it starts showing you more and more stuff. So same thing with Gundam and tanks and everything else. It's, it's pretty powerful in that regard. John doesn't like my greasy hub look. <laughs> But you can, if you if you think it's too much, you can come in and you can clean that up a little bit. Uh, but yeah, there were, that is off actually off of a uh, John voice. To be honest with you, my references of some of these the, the war bonnets, Santa Fe's, and some other trains that that particular section can get pretty greasy and grimy because there's also a pair of shock absorbers up in there too that will be um, heavily impacted and, and greased up and, and leaked out as well, seals and stuff, other stuff like that. They are not like pristinely maintained, to be honest with you, especially in the in the winter months as I'm, I'm probably we're probably going to start seeing with the Instagram Instagram conversation of a lot more uh, photos of that to Canadian Pacific and in the East Coast guys too as they get some bad weather. But I needed something also to show the technique on too, by the way to show you the pigments going into the greasy to get the kind of matte kind of caked in. You get it, up close, you get a real kind of, you get a nice cakey look to, uh, to that. You can see how it's got kind of that, you can see that it's still in the drying process. But you can see how the tip of the bristles give you kind of the, the bleed off and the runoff. It gives you that kind of fine little, almost like a, that drippy look to, to the leaks, which is kind of cool. Oops. Okay, let's continue with some more paneling around these engine doors up here. And we can move it along. I'll do some rusting up on the top of the roof there. Next. There is actually a considerable amount of detail on the side of this when you start working with these. So there is, it is a little bit, you kind of get in the rhythm of, of doing this. Let's 
So again, this is the dark color that's applied directly over to the yellow ochre that I applied earlier and dried it up. Just carefully blend that back in. So it's definitely a different mental mental process when you when you're doing panel lines, especially if you if you're used to applying and letting them sit up and then wiping them off. But I'm also weathering as I go, so it is a little bit of a of, of a slightly uh, different end game that I'm going for versus versus say you know like Chris and what you guys do with the oh Mr. Duchamp, hello 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 how are you? Bonsoir, mon ami. So you can see how I'm kind of um, just really playing up the weathering down in here, just working with what I've got. I'm not really, not really getting super concerned. It's actually quite enjoyable. It's fairly relaxed. I'm punching up some of the older sides over here a little bit more. Jiggity, jiggity, kind of a cloudy shape here. Yeah, it's not too good. It's good enough for government work. So now we've kind of moved along here from from about where I think the the first the, the first bit of weathering was from halfway through the end over to the left, and then we've kind of weathered this up in here, plus this up over in here. And I could probably come down on the pink steps down here a little bit. at the lower edge of the camera angle there. Let me switch to the dust color brush. It's got a little pink in it too. Okay, sweet. Perfect. Let's get a little pink, just a hint of the dust color. Actually, I can go a little, take a little UN white. I'm gonna lighten that pink up to almost a, just a white with a hint of pink to it. Kind of applying a lower lower edge dust underneath this pink section here. But because the pink itself is fairly light, you have to push the contrast by going even lighter. So it almost looks like I'm putting down a white. If you got a vertical streak, you drag up from below towards the top. Just reverse your brush uh, direction because I've got this little, these little, they kind of block the brush. So this way, you get a little bit. kind of speeding up a little bit. I need something with a little bit stiffer bristle. Switch into a rake. A little... Short ledges like this are sometimes a little tricky to work because you don't have a lot of surface to play with. I'm just trying to get just enough of a, a blend off the upper edge of that oil paint to give you a little bit of a hint of a streak. Very subtle light.
what I can do is I can come in here, a little bit more of a brown color, mix with a little bit of that ochre. And that's the train horn coming through town. Just drawing some darker tones right in that, that joint. A lot less thinner, more, more pure paint with that. my dry brushed edge to that. And I'll blend that out. I'll show you what, what I do with that. So this is this is the basic process of, of, of paint patina, weathering up a lighter tone, building up light to dark, working with the details of the surface of the model. See how quick that goes just by a little bit of dry brushing a little bit of stipple over the light the dark over the lighter tones below like literally almost instantly weathered and that went pretty quick actually which is nice so this is part of the flow state this is part of getting you know kind of um edges tend to go a little bit darker then they don't actually go lighter even though we dry brush the light tones in, in the verlinden conversation they actually go the other way most of the time Sharp edge will catch catch the it's either a darker metal color. It's kind of not really a chip process, but it's kind of a semi going down that road. Whether the paint's being kind of scrubbed off gently or whatever it is over time. Again, civilian pieces too, they they, they do wear and tear differently than military stuff. You know, this is this is a slow roll, if you will. <laughs> this is this happens over days and days and, and weeks and months and exposure, exposure, exposure. These aren't, you know, these don't get put away in a nice garage somewhere and washed in between half the time so their journeys are long and you know exposed in the elements quite a bit so it's a lot of that and you can spend hours doing this like you could just go to town there's really no right or wrong it just depends on your references what you're trying to do what your end game is so i'm just trying to give you kind of the quick rundown on, on getting that color down that actually looks pretty solid though I'm, you know kind of the, the pink really gives you a nice base to work with or faded paint in general does usually usually gives you a really nice base to work with. So let's put uh, let's move up top though. Let me show you kind of shit this guy over here. So this work here, this stuff here, this was pretty cool. So let's carry it over to the next section here, and it's kind of I'll show you the same idea, but because it's a flat vertical surface, you have a much different type of you don't get the verticality to play with. Uh, late, later, ATSF locos didn't get didn't get the love maintenance. Either. Yeah, you guys are talking rail stuff. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, Bryn is Bryn's actually you are a more or less a, a railroad mechanic too, and I know Craig, you are a, a a field mechanic for your work, so you you deal with heavy big machines, both of you. So they're Craig Cole and Two FS provide really good daily insights, guys. Move from John yeah, that's kind of what it is, Scott. I really enjoy it. Like, I just wasn't in the mood to do the Stug as much today as I was when I sat down yesterday to prep the stream. Like, I haven't touched the Santa Fe in a while. Let's get on this. But, you know, the, to be truth be told is is the OPR conversations I had years ago with myself, because it's just me. <laughs> you know, it's all that. Like, I'm, when I'm talking to myself, I'm like, huh, you know, um, the flexibility was key. And, and that was kind of something I was really... When I saw it all start to click in place, which is, you know, kind of a carry on from our own kind of podcast conversations that carry on from from the oils uh, and why the, the big focus on them, from at least from my side, you know, and, and I've been asked about non solvent oils and stuff, you know, whatever your product choice is, because enamels can do this. Because um, I know in the European mindset of Merco and some of the guys, they use a lot of the pure enamel paint in the same type of similar manner that I'm using the oils on the palette. 
Um, but it's, it was the pre thin conversation. It was all the, the pre-made print, pre thin stuff was really limiting to me. Whereas, whereas in this case here, I, I feel a, the flexibility provides the, just gives me that little bit of a, a maneuvering room that I can, I can do this kind of stuff in this way. So yeah, that was what it was. My end game was really was I was trying to develop out what to do with it, how to do it. Okay, so I need to lay down like a really, looks like a, what was I doing before? Like almost a pale little, like I was trying to do like, a, like I was getting a little bit of oxidation up in here on the silver paint up top and then I was adding some rust. So I'll work with a little UN white because that's a really, really, really light silver. So we'll get some light grays and I'll clean my brush out of the browns a little bit more. So all I'm doing is just using the thinner and getting the oil paint out, resetting the brush to a different color range of grays versus the tans. Not as wet of an application, so it's, the brushes are kind of wet enough now. Come in here. Kind of a light oxidation color on top of the silver. It's a little bit like a, an interesting process. A little bit, you almost don't see it. A little bit more thinner down. There's all these little tiny little rivets up here too, and there's nice little panel breaks right here. Kind of a light tone on tone oxidation almost. Since most paint kind of oxidizes white to a white anyway, it's okay. It's a safe color choice what I'm doing here. And I'm just gonna work that one kind of edge of this. There's enough surface detail up in here, thankfully. Some of these open spaces are a little spooky because it's like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Even me, I'm like, shit, what do I do with that? It's like, what, what's going on? So I'm just laying down some color here. And by weathering the lower section, I'm kind of leaving this upper um, event area, this upper vent area a little bit cleaner for right now. I'm gonna switch into my blender brush, a little bit of thinner on this just to play with it. Kind of semi-directional from the center out, not enough interaction. Kind of pull some of that color to the edge a little bit. And then I've got my little, this is when I have a lot of brushes in my hand. I've got like five of them in the hand. So I got a couple different blender type brushes. I've got my little angle jimmy jam here. So we're gonna do a little stippling. So stip with the, with the top surface like this, stippling is gonna be uh, the primary Again, when I blend, I blend to the edges of this. So I've applied the, I've applied the color and in the, in the cracks and crevices, I don't really get the brush in there. So I'm blending the outer sides of the, of the application. It's what you're seeing me do. And that kind of pulls that color. I'm trying to get you an angle so you can, so I don't block them in my hand. You can see how the stippling clouds that out, pulls it into the center of the pan a little bit more. Fortunately, the, the engine's heavy enough that it, it, it withstands the pressure as I push down on this. That's why you see the model shake a little bit. Kind of dragging it out to the edge a little bit. So I get kind of a, the whole top of that panel's got a little bit, and it looks like shit sometimes too, and that's okay, because it looks like shit in the real world too. They're not always pretty perfect streaks and, and stuff, and you want kind of that gritty cloudiness. And it's the same principle of, of why I put the pigment in the beginning of this demo stream today was the same principle of versus airbrushing all this stuff, which you can probably do if you wanted to. But you can see how quickly I can get kind of a, a natural, dusty, distempered kind of style to this. I think the music is really playing well today with, with what I'm doing. See how I've kind of streaked those off of there? How quickly that happens over here, I'm probably not quite happy with this. Let's stiffen this a little bit more. Let's clean this guy and make it a little bit more precise. Just a, just a smidge, just a smidge. 
and then the oils will dry to a matte finish and that'll give you that oxidation look on top of the the shinier paint which was shiny in real life shinier you know it's not like a, it's, not, it's a civilian so it wasn't like a matte painted and that's where you get that contrast and that's why uh i yell at you on the barn <laughs> get really mad at you guys in the barns conversation like you don't want to be varnishing this if you can avoid it because if you don't have to touch this like if you're even if you're a railroader you guys out there like you don't have to touch that area like you shouldn't be physically touching that area anyway so you can you could let this this is paint so you can let this set up and do its thing and you should be okay you know most of your your, your handling you know I'm, I'm sure you guys have gotten really comfortable with certain spots that you can handle these uh, and i've got the railings off still and everything like that too so but this particular section up here you can you can leave as is so i'm just kind of stippling that through i see slightly different to the camera the light hitting this but is this dry? See, this is where I've got the harmony of the brush in the thinner, just in the, I've got it in the magic spot. I'm actually really happy with this. So this just has just a hint of thinner on it. There's a little bit of thinner that was residual on that, but you can see how dry that went down and how controllable that was. So that's the first stages there. Uh, you guys are doing your thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oops, I gotta scroll down. Sweet. Uh, yep, you guys. Yep, you guys can hang out and have fun. Um, John's Josh is back. Okay, so let's put in a little bit. Let me shift the tones a little bit into more of the orangey rush, uh, like we've got over here. So I've got the oxidation down. Um, I can hit this with. It's pretty dry, but you know, never hurts. Over here, make sure all this is good and dry too. Now you'll have, in truth, I've dried this, but it's probably still the maximum dry cure thing is probably at 70 or 80%. So you have, if you ever have to do anything for the next 24 hours or so, say for example, I can just see this here. You can just see it right there on the ledge of this step. There's a little spot I miss, but it's been on there for a while now. But you, it's still, oils have enough of a window of love. I can come in here, boom, done, fixed it. Okay, cool, caught my little mistake there. I do need a spot I can touch this. It's starting to get my work. Okay, I'm talking to myself. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're okay. So I'm going to rotate that down. I'm going to leave this little ledge here a little bit cleaner for right now. I haven't quite figured out what I want to do with it just yet, how, how intense I want to go with it. So let's just focus on the top up here. And this is good, too, because sometimes you'll have that where I'm like, I'm not sure exactly what I want to do on this little walking ledge here um where i really want to go with it just yet so i'm going to work this out and kind of gets me a little bit more in the mental capacity of okay, understanding things a little bit better here and then i could i can come in kind of i'm already going to be warmed up if that makes sense and, and kind of in a better you know way to go with with this ledge down here and i'll have to look at this a little bit closer to how beat up that's going to get you know because that's where the guy's going to be walking and working and all sorts of stuff and i can imagine it gets pretty effed up so but let's stay on the top part up here because it's going to it's going to be a little bit easier time with that so that's the oftentimes how I'll approach things too. Like if I have a little bit of trepidation to work in that, I'm like, ah, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do just yet, which is normal. No big deal. So I'm gonna grab some kind of light orange rust tone and that paint too is another one like my yellow ochre that's on its last legs. The faded, <laughs> I forget what they call that, faded Dunkelgeld, faded German three-tone color. It's technically orange. <laughs> it's like the dumbest name of all the oil paints. I, I will talk shit about that. Like, what are you doing? Faded three-tone? Like, come on, guys. Trying real hard there. Uh, taking the orange oil paint, <laughs> as it were. What I'm talking about is a 502 uh, Aptilon uh, name. A, I think that orange color is actually faded German three-tone camo. I don't know. They're getting a little too creative, in my opinion. Okay, so let's just start doing a little bit of light orange as your base rust. Again, there's almost no thinner because you've already got oil down on that surface. See, I'm just applying that real gentle-like. A little bit of a stipple, a little bit of a jiggity-jiggity. Some of that oxidation has kind of a pattern to it. I don't want the whole thing rusted out or anything of the sort. I just want some, some interest to it. And I'm looking at the work to the left of it, just to kind of see. So 
So this is a little bit more of the hand painted effort. Maybe I'm being a little bit of the artist, if you will, as well. Uh, it's a good idea to probably, if you really want to do this to a precise level, is really pull in some some good pictures of what this looks like. And there's a there's actually with drone photography now, you get quite a few of the guys in the rail yards with the drones looking top down on these. So you do get some really good references out there if you look for them. They're actually pretty cool, to be honest with you. Yeah, I was listening to the uh, the USA Gundam Story interview, uh, Zach and Adam do twice a week. Those that know, you guys probably know what I'm talking about. But Adam was talking about his his interest in other hobbies was drones uh, to a point. So I was thinking, yeah, I'd, I'd probably be interested in that too. Like if I had to have another hobby besides the scale modeling and, and the painting and stuff like that, I think the drones would be would be pretty fun. Albeit expensive and a cash drain, as all good hobbies are, right? So now I'm just, again, I'm blending around the oranges, just kind of this slightly mixing in a little bit with the oxidation color underneath, but not really a wet application blend. Oops, slightly off camera there, yeah, sorry. I'm just real gently softening up that, that rusty kind of, and sometimes they do kind of rust in shapes because there's, there's probably a form under that. I've seen some photos of that. In fact, that's kind of what I'm showing you there. Like as that metal wraps over a little bit, just before that bend, it will probably get a little bit of a rust effect through there sometimes. So now I'm just softening up. And what this does, this little blending softening right here, what I'm doing is it takes away some of the brush strokes. What I'm really doing with this right here is when you apply it down with the brush, any kind of paint, you're going to get a brush stroke of some form. Usually that's what happens on a drier application. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do now is I'm just coming into a, to a scale effort of just knocking down my brush strokes. More or less, that's what I'm doing. So that's why I kind of dance around the edges of what I put down. It just softens that and gives you that kind of a little bit more of a realistic look. And you'll see sometimes you'll lose a little bit of the lower color a little bit, but there's so little thinner, it's not that big of a deal. And that's kind of the Bob Ross attitude of just whatever happens with that as some sort of you know happy blending on its own. I just let it go tend to find that ends up being looking pretty realistic to begin with anyway. So I don't really, like I'm not really trying to paint too specifically, but I've got just some, some nice little kind of continuation of the rust tones over here. And there's so little thinner going down. It's drying pretty, pretty quick. And I'm actually just using the tip of this bristle, being real precise with it, kind of just jiggity jiggity. I can see it through the glasses up close. It's probably a slight angle off the camera. But I have it, I can't really see it. I actually have to tilt my head to see the oxidation of the oil paint that I put down first to get the light to catch that. Because when I do this, see how that disappears? I can't see what I'm doing. So. I actually have to kind of tilt this out a little bit so I can actually see the, the, the difference between the colors and, and how this is working. Because this is when it, it when, when you go this way, that see how that starts to look now? That's when you start to get that, oh, that looks pretty sweet. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm doing this for demo, but I am kind of, if you see me moving around a little bit, it's because what I'm trying to do is actually see what the F is going on. <laughs> like, what is going on? Like, I can't see. So yeah, that's why I don't have it quite like that because it see how it instantly disappears. But you can see the rust tones, what I've done with that. And that's what I'm talking about where, um, in the backside of this, I haven't painted, so I can kind of touch that a little bit. And I left that intentionally so I could kind of maneuver this with, for the demo. If I was to figure this out, by the way, if I was to do this for real, real, I'd probably set pull this whole case off and then attach it to some form that I could handle, what you like you do with figures and other stuff. So you're seeing me physically touch stuff just because it's mostly for demo practices and it's just easier this way. Because it's hard for me to put something on a mount and then on a camera and then film the whole thing. So just BTW that one out. Like, okay, just understand that that's not totally what I'm doing normally. Because that's why you probably hear me when I talk about when I do stuff off camera. It's because it's so much nicer to do stuff off camera. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. I'm like, oh, yeah, I have, to, I have to go back in and clean that up a little bit. But what's happening is, is these, these blenders are now are, have got enough thinner back and forth, back and forth that they're these blenders are now in a sweet spot, which happens after about an hour of working with the oil paints and stuff like that. All these little blenders, they've got just a hint of thinner on them and they, I can really maneuver the oil paint quite nicely. That's a pretty 
you could, yeah, you can just see a little bit of all the different stuff happening. So now let's go a little bit darker. What are we doing on time here? What are we, 2.15? Okay, sweet. Rolling good. Do a little bit more here. So now I'm getting a little bit more of the burnt sienna, which is my favorite rust tone. And now this is kind of a mapping process. Trains are coming through hard today. I'm trying to get just the angle for you guys. There we go. So now I'm gonna build up the darker, pure rust tones in the middle of these. So this is very much similar to a layered chipping concept. Now you actually can't. There it goes. See, that's what I've just because <laughs> you can see what I'm talking about, the glare of the angle, how at certain certain points it won't look. You're like, what's he doing? So that's just to be fair. There is. So this is me building up the, the middle rust, the, the rust stones through the middle of that. Take the blender and I'm just kind of again, I'm kind of gently blending the two tones a little bit, but I'm trying to leave the center of the darker rust tones alone. You can see how that just instantly cleaned it up and turned into like a layered. Same thing over here. Okay. And this is where you get, this is the same idea as microchipping. Like what you see Adam and Martin, those guys talking about quite a bit. It's basically the same application process where you have the light tones down first. And so what I'm doing is I'm intentionally leaving the, the outer softer orange tones of the fresher rust on the outer edge of these of these uh, rusted area. Wouldn't really call it chipped, but it is technically the paint's gone. So it is kind of also a sort of chipping process. But this is much more of a civilian look versus a military paint chip kind of, kind of, kind of conversation, if that makes sense to you guys. I think it does. Yeah, I'm just trying to be real specific. Again, you're at the camera's at a slightly oblique angle, so hold on here, I'll show you. Let me turn this up and around. Again, I'm just using that the orange tones that are down there is kind of my general. And this is where it gets pretty easy. You're just, right now, it's just color by numbers. I've got the light oxidation layer down first. Got the light orange rust on top of that. So the hard part's done. And now I just have to be precise with what I'm doing on, on the darker rust tones. Because they actually know where they're all supposed to go, which is good. You can see I'm building that up, building that up real slow. And actually that kind of replicates in other versions of modeling at a much larger scale. Because remember, this is 187, by the way. So do keep that in mind. So it's pretty close to 1 100 in, in reality. So you do want to maintain that process, but this is also replicating very similar to how salt chipping uh, has a, has a end result as well. So now I'm going to take a little bit of my burnt umber raw umber mix, go a little bit more dark pure brown, which is more of your, your exposed steel color. Just kind of almost dry brush in some of those darker rust spots. I'm gonna dry brush the edges of this piece a little bit around this hatch edge, just to pop that off visually. And that's what I did over in here, a little bit more of the darker brown tones. So you can see how that starts to darken up now. And they don't have to hit all of those, you just have to hit a little bit of it. And again, as you also can see, I'm not, I don't, I've not done anything over here with this because I can i can come back in and rust tone up this at another point in time. So I could just work this little section. And that's all I'm doing is just showing you how I added the rust to these little sections in here. So 
So in this way, I don't, I don't want the rust areas to be super same, same. So I do want them to show kind of a, a, a similar uh, destructive path in terms of paint wear and tear. But, and I think what I did was I actually put another layer of dust on top of the rust. That's actually what I did. You can see that kind of grayed out rusty tone. I actually put a layer of dust on top of the rust at a later point in time. So again, to show age and time. Cause that's the other side of this is where what really happens uh, to these in the real life is that these will rust over the period of time and the, but the dust accumulates at the same time so you're going to get the rust with the dust dusty rust rusty dusty what do you any, anybody from los angeles remember dusty street fly low and avoid the radar <laughs> little dj from la is kind of a, another little happy little but I can actually come in here and lighten this up a little bit uh, yeah you're welcome Brian but that's how easy this is when you when you really get down to this in terms of like I'm not this isn't like a show-off this is like I hope you guys can translate this to your own work by just the precision of the brushes why I use these brushes you know how little uh, of the chemicals on the brush you can see why this this uh, to me is a, a more powerful process than the than a thin enamel because you'd have to manipulate the enamels quite a bit to get it to be this precise but the oil paints versus an acrylic you know conversation and i think craig cole and some of you guys out there that really embraces Zal that you really start to really pull this in it's starting to click home for a lot of you guys i think you know that you can see kind of what i'm doing here i did put a little bit of that dark metal edge there so you get kind of a and what I'm trying to show here is kind of the form. I'm trying to really put, punch up this form a little bit where there's just kind of a soft rounded, but kind of an edgy or it, it's rounded, but it's sharp. It's, if that makes sense, it's kind of a softened uh, edge up here. And you can see how precise, how delicate this is. You know, I'm not man. It's actually super chill. Like this is like, I wish I had the games on. I could just do this while talking. <laughs> Would you? Oh, Patrick Stout, how are you? What do we got here? Question. Hey, Mike, going back to the Stug, was the base paint just mission models? Yep, that's all it was. Uh, in fact, if I do a winter whitewash, it's it, it's a comment that I make back in those streams, uh, Patrick, on terms of whitewash painting in particular, or even the DAC, the Desert Africa core painting. Anytime you have that dark original color, just honestly paint the whole thing. Just don't sweat all that bullshit. You will never see it. You can modulate it and, and fuss it up and, and layers of rush chips and all. Trust me, dude, you'll never see that stuff. As soon as that white goes over it, gone. So don't waste your time. Just paint it dark gray. You'll save yourself a lot of time and headache. There's, there's no point to worry about it. Unless your whitewash is gonna be mostly worn off and then you can have some pre-weathering underneath, but usually that's 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 a pretty rare case. It just depends, but in the case of what I did with this particular stood, yeah, it's just, just dark pans are gray. And the darker, the better. Same with the same if it's a whitewash over a dunkel gelb in the later war, go a really dark dunkel gelb because you just if it's the white, over the late war pale dunkel grub color there's no contrast you almost don't see it and even though you can definitely do it and work with it if that's the, what you're doing no big deal but you'll find with white washes you the pure the base color the the more positive results you get out of it so anyhow okay looks are solid you do a good job so i got my leaky greasy uh, rusty hubs down here trucks that uh, mr john fossey doesn't like but you got them now my friend So, but I do, let's zoom out a little bit here so you guys can kind of see what's happening. So probably what I'll do um, is I'll finish this off camera probably this week, uh, take the final photos of this left side, do some cool Instagram shit with it, um, throw it up there so you guys can see the final final. Cause I do have to figure out these open grates, I'll probably have to throw some pretty dark contrasty blacks and stuff up in there too, just to finish that off. Kind of like I did over here. Um, but yeah, that's looking pretty good. We've got this, these trucks down here, you know, 75% to this, which is, I'm fine with for now. Uh, and then up here, you can see how we've carried the rust tones up over here, bringing that along that way. Uh, and I'd probably, what I would do again for, for the real stuff, uh, is definitely find some top down photos of some of the projects like this, cause it, this will happen for sure. But you can see the, the fresher punch of this versus the dustier punch of this. So. I have to come in and do some more stuff, but I've got a nice oxidation down. This up here again. When you when you rotate that to kind of an eye level, you see the oxidation happening in there. 
it's not really a dust it's kind of how the, the paint's kind of coming off a little bit so it's kind of working pretty well um, but I'm kind of liking how that's looking it's turning out pretty good my friends so we got a little bit of weathering going on that and I can continue on so it showed you kind of just enough of the general application stuff to kind of get a good, really good idea to proceed with your own projects in terms of similar ideas same same but different you know, not everybody's doing the same identical projects, but the but the power of the of the the flow of the OPR is pretty pretty good with that. Because we're going to switch gears again. <laughs> we'll go to this guy. But this time we're going to let's weather up on top of the of this up in here, because that's kind of where I wanted to go with it. Because this stuff over here, while we can definitely, if I continue on to show it, I'm still waiting for the snow to show up. It should be here Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so we'll do the tracks and stuff next week. We'll do the snow, the promised snow application stuff next week. Uh, but we've seen how we've done the fenders here through all of this here. So this this over here will be quite similar, but this up here will be a little bit different. So let's let's focus on that uh, for now, just to kind of get something going here. Tilt that up a little bit that way. Okay, let me get my brushes set. Any questions? Any more questions? Yeah. Did that look good, Bryn? Okay, yeah, I thought that looked pretty solid. Given my limited experience, I thought that was not too bad for on the fly work, you know, because I'm not really following any sort of photos with 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 the rust and, and the oxidation and those kind of things. But civilian stuff does have a slightly different result than the um, military time and service um, type of services into, you know, combat does do different things for sure. The intensity of it. Uh, what am I looking for? This guy, my dust one. OK, so what I'm going to do on this piece here, let me. Switch cameras again, swim back in. That yeah, should be a good brushing. Really. Yeah, okay. All right. So let's go, I'm gonna go a little bit more in the gray tones. So this is a little bit different process in sense of its location, the fact that there's gonna be two humans that, that basically fill these spaces up quite a bit. Um, again, it's, it's not too different to be truthful, uh, even though it's a winter piece to kind of what this is. Um, the same 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 so what you're going to see me do with this a little bit is work more towards as i'm looking at this there's a little bit of dust and stuff in the hinges but this is a winter piece where there's a lot less dust involved but there will be gatherings of dirt and stuff around the hinges so i'm just trying to get my bearings with that a little bit because i don't want to screw this particular piece up but what i will do is a little bit different approach I'm just kind of studying this for a second. So I think I'm going to go a little bit more of the gray tone, less dirty yellow in terms of dust color to kind of more of a grayish tone, maybe a little bit more of a whitewashed. Uh, let me see here. My white is dried too. Let me punch that open a little bit. So I take my little stir stick and I punch that oil open and then I, I put a little bit of thinner in there to wet it back up. That way it flows into the brush. See where this, so what I do is I'm gonna I'm gonna start slow. Okay, that's almost unnoticeable. So let me go a little bit more white. So it's almost like a like a whitewashed dust kind of collected around this a little bit. It's a little bit like mapping in a sense, but not quite a hundred percent the same thing just yet. So this is just a UN white with a little pure white, kind of a light gray whitish tone. And you can see this a little bit wet of the thinner. So again, it's still a light to dark process, believe it or not. Because what I'm trying to do is just, just this, this might all disappear later on anyway. Depends on how I, I start building this up. You may not even actually see some of this. That's okay. But what this actually does is add subtle layers at this early stage right now, because I'm going to go really conservative in terms of the, the actual earth effects and some of them. There's no real mud to play with. There's no real dirtiness to play with other than just wearing the paint off. So this adds a little bit of layer of white kind of grayish tones to the white wash underneath. There goes some truck air brakes right there, slowing down. And the angle, camera angle is good because you guys can actually see the fluid on the surface. So you can see how controlled that is. You get a blender brush here. Same idea, I blend the edges of all of that. 
and that leaves a pure color I've applied kind of where I want it right now. But there is there is a subtlety of the layer compared to the compared to this here that's just pure paint. There is a subtlety to the oil paints right now that's going on. This is a very controlled, intentionally designed to be um, the master of the domain, if you will, because I don't want to f this up at all because you'll ruin the whole model. This is where you have to, the stress level does ramp up a little bit because in this particular scenario, the figures, there is no figures on this because the hatches are closed. So I have to show you that representation. Um, and it does require a little bit on my part to make sure that I do this properly. Cause it's real easy to get looking like the engine hat. In other words, I'm trying not to make it look like the engine hatches. So that does constrain you by its nature of conservatism in terms of weathering. I want patina, I want human interaction, but at the same time, I don't want it to look like my engine deck because obviously that's that's a, a wholly different scenario. What happens over here, actually, even though it's really close to this, is very different to what happens up in the hatches. Hey, what's up, Squid? No, you're fine. You're all good, brother. Uh, could watch this all night, but at least... Uh, you're welcome, Brian. Catch up. Have a good night, my friend. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, <laughs> John, I'm just giving you a bad time. Just having fun with you, my friend. I know you like it. I know. Can't always take me too literally. I am a Seinfeld fan, remember? Okay. So that's kind of, I got a little bit, you can, and actually you can, you can see it, even though it's, it's literally almost invisible is what I did right here. You can see that it's different to this already. So there is just a hint to what I'm doing with that, which is fine. I'm totally cool with that. Totally cool with that. Now, what I'm going to probably do, though. So now I'm going to avoid. Let me get all the brown, yucky color out of this brush. So again, also remember, I'm, I'm bouncing from model to model a little bit. So there is, I am doing having some cleaning on my color brushes. But you can pull another brushes here. Actually, let me just do that. I'm just pulling another brush here. We'll just go more of a gray. I want more of a gray, Panzer gray, dark tone. So for that, I've got my dark mud color, which is your basic dark gray color in here. And I'm going to go with a hint of, of the dark blue with the dark green. That's a little bit of a dark turquoise with the dark gray. I have a hint of black. Let's see how I've done here. Yep, that's good. So what I don't want is brown. For right now, what I do not want to put on this is any kind of browns up, up top. The browns are down here. We're going to go a slightly different color range up top. So we're going to run this. It's almost no thinner. It's it's it's. The oil's wet, but it's not bleeding. It's not running in that panel line. So you can see the tonal difference. See how this is a, a, is a cooler grayish tone versus the, the brownish tones down here. I'm going to immediately blend this effect in. And the reason I'm doing that this part this way a little bit, because this is a natural inclination for the for the commander here to uh, to handle this part. And I kind of want to see how dark and contrasty that gets. And you can see how the panel line already popped out, which is totally fine. So I almost don't have to put additional. Let me dry this up and see what I've got going on here. So it's already starting to come to life a little bit, which is good. I'm working pretty slow with this one. Because what I have to do here with the angle for the camera and everything else is I have to do this over here too. Be real precise. Get a little bit of that edge right there. And I can do the same over here. It's going to happen over here too. Even though I got that beautiful white down, I hate to lose it. So now I'm kind of edging this up with a darker, greasier. Do a little bit of this too. Oops. Jam that handle right up to the camera. Okay, let me switch to my angle, my little Jimmy Jam here. This guy. Let's clean that up real good. So this is a fresh, nearly dry blender. I'm going to come in and stipple that. Kind of at a reverse angle for a camera view, but I'm going to kill most of this color, but there's going to be enough of this left that it's going to do what it's supposed to do. Because actually that the, what I put down was fairly uh, translucent. So it looks a little 
strong right now, but that's because it's still pretty wet. It will calm down when I dry this. But I do want to get a hint of contrast in this anyway. So this is starting to weather up these top hatches here a little bit. Really, and it's really, really similar to what I just showed you at the top of the train with the oxidation coloring. When I put that down, it's a very, very similar process. Slightly different color spectrum. I have to do this edge up here. There's a little bit of dark rime up there. Hold on, here. Just get that. I have to get the right angle for this guy right in here. And the beauty of this stage here is that we did this weeks ago. So this is all dried up in here. So I've actually got a lot of buffer wiggle room to kind of come in and, and do what I need to do without ruining the previous work at all, which is kind of nice. So by working kind of that process all the way through here, I've given this area plenty of time to, to be its own. Yeah, that actually doesn't, that actually turned out pretty good. There we go. I actually got that pretty good. Okay. Just enough to kind of show that it's just a greasy used area, but it doesn't really like overbearingly, you know, if I zoom out, you can see how this is kind of what I see. So you can see we've got some discolorations up in here, but it's, it's not this kind of discoloration. So it's got a slightly different vibe to it because it's human interaction more than a greasy engine compartment, even though there's going to be some greasy grime. Uh, rest on the silver spot on. Thank you, Bryn. Uh, could watch this. Oh, that was that. Is that the last comment? You guys are just chilling like a villain. How are the games going? Everybody doing well? Uh, let's see here. So let's come back in here. I'm just rotating this for a little bit. But you can see why that uh, this lazy Susan, this little circular device is is really really convenient for. Me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put some kind of a, like a precise speckling, but I'm going to come back in and stipple this. Because what I'm trying to do now is, is, is I'm going to start weathering this way with it eventually. But I'm going to have to do this guy's hatch too. So I'm, I'm very much everything's in control right now. And, and I worked in really just with a little bit of just, okay, let's make sure I do this correctly. So I was really kind of slow with kind of moving in with that, which is totally fine. Um, and then I was able to kind of, without putting in the heavy panel lines, but in other words, I, I didn't do any capillary action between the panel lines, which I'm a little bit avoiding because that's a lot of thinner. I want a drier, um, more subdued application in here in terms of the control of the darker tones on this pure, on this almost pure white up here. And hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So now I can come up, I can grease these hinges a little bit more, even though I put the wider down earlier, I can kind of just, you know, imagine that hinge might be, might require some maintenance at some time, it might gather some grease and dust. Switch into the blender. But not as anywhere near what I got on the, on these hinges down to the left here on the engine deck. So it's a really controlled process here. And the better job that you do, because so, for example, down on the engine deck, I'm going to have stowage and some other stuff. So I'm going to have an ability to continue on. But up here, there's not going to be any, almost anything else up here. So I have to make sure I do a really good job with this because you have to pull this off. That's that's a kind of this is kind of a critical element to the model. If you screw this part up, up here, if you go too heavy handed on a project of this nature where you have this this upper exposed. Imagine if this is also the top of a turret. It's what I talked about with the Tiger One photo. Uh, earlier with the top of that turret, I'm doing the same ideas here, but they're way more reduced down in, in control, even more so than before. And that's to ensure I just get a hint of weathering because you can see a little goes quite a bit. And what, what this allows me, it's another little part of the conversation is that you have to be really careful sometimes of, of backing yourself into a corner. Like if I went too much too soon on this hatch area up here, I'm gonna jam myself into that. That's what I'm gonna be stuck with. So by going lighter and lighter and lighter a little bit to where I'm just got a hint of stuff going on, 
Uh, this allows me to build up more colors over time if I want to continually push up and I've got that option. Whereas if I go too dark too fast, you eliminate that option and then you're screwed. <laughs> like, oh shit. So it's kind of, the, the, it does play into my mental where I'm going with this in terms of, again, to, to pull this photo back up. You know, so you can kind of see where if you look down the side of the of the upper hole here, like in here, this is just dust on gray. So it's going to be a little bit different to the whitewash, but I have an ability to come in here still because I have room to maneuver and build up some darker tones if I want to pull in some more panzer grays or expose some stuff. So in this kind of conversation, excuse me, I'm leaving myself and you can see his open hatches. So that's why this edge here is going to be flipped backwards most of the time. So you don't need a ton of uh, grease and grime on the edge of that hatch a little bit. And then I'll do this other part. But, but that's kind of where my mental state is with a lot of this right now. Like you can see here, I'm leaving myself some wiggle room to add more contrast in here. So if imagining this was whitewash, which you can kind of do, this goes back to Dimitri and some of the other questions or some of the other, I forget who asked the question of if like, if you don't have the specifics uh, is using. So this is a dusty version of the same tank uh, idea. So I'm kind of pretending it's whitewash, if you will. Like I'm pretending all this is white up in here and stuff. So yeah, that's what I'm doing with this. Even though the dust. But what happens with the dust is you can see. So I've got contrast and dirt up here. Whereas in here, this dust continually cakes up on there, cakes up on there, cakes up on there. So that's kind of what you're seeing. So there's a little bit of difference, but I'm trying to, I'm looking at this kind of what up here. Cause that's a good look. That's you get like a nice whitewash deck and then you have kind of a worn upper area. So it's a good photo. So why references are crucial. I wish I owned these pictures, by the way, guys. I do. I really do wish I, I, as a publisher, I would love to have access and do that kind of stuff. You know, I think I think Ken Forward Publishing and Peko, uh, is it Peko? P-E-K-O out of, out of uh, Finland or Sweden. I forget where they're from. And then you have the new Panzerex type stuff. Because Panzerex is moving into more vehicle specific, unit specific stuff too. Um, but I do know they take a lot of stuff out of the, out of the video footage. Plus, plus the findings of the stills that they get. So what you saw was, see, I put a little bit of thinner down, so I don't want to stain this with a darker color. But I kind of want to take that same tone here. So that's exactly what I was talking about. I left myself some room to build up more contrast. And that's kind of what I'm doing with this right here. So there's just a hint of thinner on that. A little bit of color goes down. Kind of gives you that, imp the, 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 I'm kind of implying that, that that's kind of a worn off area a little bit. Let's just add in the next little bit to that. But these are the critical stages to see how it looks right there. That's what I see. So that's, that, these are kind of critical stages. And dry this off. And you'll see when you dry it, how it kind of kicks it down a little bit. So that's starting to build up that colorway. Now the beauty of this, so because um, it is, it is a little bit breaking away from the pure light to dark conversation, is what I can do with this is I can come back in with the white. So this is a little bit, probably a little bit long, more along the lines of advanced, a little bit more advanced type stuff. Because you kind of have to know what you're doing a little bit at this point in time. So I can come back in here with a little bit of the white. And kind of go around what I just put down. This is kind of the UN white, a little bit mixed with the pure white. And kind of, if I if, if say I've lost too much of the of the tone, I can build back up some of the whites I lost a little bit. And this kind of goes to the conversation of of sometimes you'll have to go back over previous stuff a little bit to get kind of a look you're after. So I'm just using this as kind of an example. Just kind of slightly blending this brush strokes up a little bit. And white's so powerful, it does not take much to shift stuff back. But you can see how here, right in here, I was able to cut down some of that darker weathering tone a little bit. So say you get in that position where you have to kind of maybe fix some stuff or adjust, and this is kind of, it's the little sometimes of a, of a back and forth, if that makes more sense. 
and you just have to accept it as it is. Like the heart, the light to dark rule is a really good like guideline, but it's not like set in stone at all. Like don't misinterpret that one. But it is a really safe, secure, excellent way to proceed. So now this is kind of almost dry brushing. There's a little peak edge there. Just kind of dry brushing it a little bit. Oops, a little too much. So I'm just working these panels now. Be really, really slow and cautious, not too much thinner at all. Just clean that blender brush up a little bit. Come back in here, clean that up a little bit, push that down. There you go. So now I've kind of completed that without putting a panel line in there directly. I've been able to completely go around this whole edge in such a way that I've, 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 I'm pushing that into that gap. So that's what that's what you're seeing me kind of physically do with the brush there. So I'm actually kind of it's kind of a slight little jiggly jiggly into the pushing into the thing. And then same thing here, this little, that's why these brushes are so nice. You get so precise of a tip. I can come in here, just clean it up a little bit and push that into that gap right there, going back the other way. So that's how powerful, that's why I really like these brushes because you do have that ability at times where you really need the precision. I'll let that dry it up that little, so just kind of tightening that up a little bit more. And this is how you get stuff really precise. And the more precise you get, the more in scale it's going to look, the better the results are going to be at the end of the day, you know, responses uh, from your from your compatriots. Compatriots. From your comrades. So I'm just putting it down because it doesn't take much at all. And actually it looks darker on the camera at that angle. But let's just do this back edge just a little bit. I'll show you again with the, the white back over the dark. But this is so translucent. It's not really a light over a dark conversation, what I mean in the usual context. Because remember there were some light whites that I put down first. They're blending in a little bit with this work right now. I can kind of see it happening. They're kind of softening up and getting a little cloudy, which is cool. So then what I can do is I can come back in for another layer of a, of a little bit lighter tone. Kind of just build up this hatch guy a little bit. So this is putting the white back over again one more time. Kind of a force speckling almost, if you will. Just kind of this will give a little bit more of a visual interest and slight break up to this to the whitewash effect in there. See how that kind of adds a little bit of like white hot spots a little bit, but they're so translucent. They're gonna cut cut down a little bit as I do this. So you can see how this right hatch here looks compared to the just the basic chipped hairspray chipped uh, worn out look here that's not been weathered yet so you can see how what happens with the layers of kind of the white the translucent grease and grime the back up into that now just in that that quick little time that we spent so that shows you how i start to really start to tackle the weathering up and over this thing now i'm so good so jammed up in here and there's a little bit of glare from outside the the cloudy sunny sky is shifting over a little bit. Try that back up so you can see that. But that look of that commander's hatch, um, comparatively speaking to the other side, you know that's a good kind of visual comparison. So you can kind of see between the right and left sides. Maybe a little bit of a corner. So you can see, I still need to, whoops, that's not the one I want, I want the blender. Let me hold this up here and get out of there. Okay, so see how I've got a little bit of a, of a let of an edge to my darker tone in there. You can take your blender. My, I've got so much oil paint on my fitter, it's getting tinted. I'm trying this up, I'm good. So, this is self-evaluation. A little bit needs to be cleaned up in here. Actually, that blender's. Let 
Let me get more of a clean, fresh blender. This is why having more brushes on hand is good. Sometimes you want to have a really fresh, clean blender. I want real precise work around that. Because that's going to be really visually exposed to all the viewers, all the, all the pictures, all the cameras. So they're kind of started to really soften that up a little bit. It's about a half a mil distance from the edge of the panel. There's a little bit of a dark ridge from the oil, just a little bit. Just gently soften that up. And that's where cameras don't lie. There it goes. Cut that down a little bit. So it's just a hint of, and that's wet, so it looks darker than it is. So let's try that. Try that a little bit. Take our white again. So this is a layered process going back and forth and working with it until you're, you're kind of happy with the end result. Just kind of left a little bit of it. Just it's so translucent. You're getting enough of the the visual difference between the dark and the light, but you're getting kind of a layered effect now that is it's starting to really come out nicely. So this adds a lot of visual depth to an area that just would be really, really hard to to get that kind of pulled off a little bit. So I, I have it weathered. It's still a little bit wet, but there's enough of a hint of weathering there on the, on those hinges and those hatches up in here. And that's kind of what I was going for. And you can see I've got a little bit of a, just a little bit of a bit here too. And this is because sometimes the camera sees better than the, the old Mark One eyeballs. Soften this cap. And by leaving this side alone a little bit for now, it gives me a good kind of sense of, of like, do I even need to weather this very, very little to get this effect what I'm looking for? Yeah. Yeah, that came up pretty good. Right on, right on. All right, almost three o'clock. All right, guys, any final questions here? I think I'm at a good stopping point, to be honest with you. Because we'll keep going through the... As, as we get the snow on and this stuff, too, we'll, we'll be able to keep going, too. Just kind of soften some of that up right there, just to make sure that it comes out nice. Yeah. I'm actually trying to do that at a fairly high level for you guys, too. You can kind of see... Really nice discoloration to that greasy tone through the kind of the crew has worn that off. It's it's a more grayish tone to the, the warmer browns. Kind of softly working that up there. Yeah, it's not bad. That turned out pretty good. It's turned out pretty good. Because that'll give you a good reference point for when I start doing the other hatches. Just kind of listen to work. I hope you're the first time. I love the uh, hot moments as work. Yeah, and that's kind of, you'll need those too. Hairspray Chip and Christian, hello, hello, hello. How you doing, buddy? Uh, Kodokai, stop in to say hello and then promptly goodbye. Oh, it's all good, brother. Good to see you, Bri. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I'll see you on your stream this week, too. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, tank is looking great. Might you do this for a living? <laughs> I should, huh? Right? That's a good idea. Yeah, let's zoom out a little bit. Give you guys a better perspective. Sometimes when you zoom in a little bit, it, it looks a little stronger than it is. But you can kind of see now. That quick little 20 minutes worth of work is worth it because I also don't want to lose the really nice kind of patina of the white and gray that's underneath all of it. So laying these translucent tones on top of this to, to wear it out a little bit and get a little bit, you know, flow of the colorway across this. And I might put a tarp over the front of that too. I might actually get into that. We might do a tarp, a little bit of a tarp demo later on. Patty Cakes, uh, who's text that you should, should through the episodes. Yeah, I'll have to do that. I mean to do that actually for myself and, and put this all together. Uh, you'll probably see some edited content in the future, Patty, with um, some of that stuff, what you're talking about. Uh, it's on it's on the to-do list <laughs> yeah another another thing hey tj how you doing brother yeah that's this is this is kind of where i'm at right now i know everybody's kind of busy with these these weekends with the football and school and everything else especially in the u.s plus we had our big um our big 20th anniversary of 9 11 this weekend so it's a little bit of a, a somber kind of uh remembering 
kind of a thing. The dark here in the top looks amazing, really natural. Yeah, and that's kind of really, like I said, this is, you know, again, to hit it home one more time, my friends. You kind of see where I'm, I'm kind of using a dusty reference is, is kind of, yeah, just kind of working the colorways a little bit. But this kind of helps in terms of, you know, what I'm trying to do to get kind of, I've still got room to maneuver, which I really like. This is really nice. It's a good kind of, it, this may not even be the final for this section. So it's kind of a nice position to be in uh, when you're kind of doing, because this is whitewash in particular, where you're, if the challenge of it, just like a desert vehicle, the challenge of it is there's not a lot of moisture to work in the heavier grease and grit. Like even on the train, there's, there's just daily moisture and stuff going on. But this is different. This is, you know, low humidity, frozen tundra, maybe a month into that winter campaign uh where it's starting to be you know all that's starting to happen so yeah i'm liking where this is going because i i want to maintain some of the some of the white tones up through here kind of what you see with the dust because this shows you the patterns the, 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 the reason i like this photo is it shows you the wear and tear patterns of the stug with the crew because you'll see what's going to happen uh that i can apply this look and i may be able to grease up some of this white maybe not i'll see how it goes what i want to do but this gives me that options, and that's really where I'm happy is now I've got choices, and I want to have choices. Um, but yeah, it's in, in the asymmetrical. I do need to do like a pure asymmetry conversation with everything too. Asymmetry is uh, asymmetrical stuff's a fairly important conversation because you can see we've even got asymmetrical between the sides here and everything else. So, but any final questions, my friends? No, I actually have kind of ideas to do that too. Oh, what else have we got? Did I miss anything? Did I miss any good conversations? I was kind of head down half the time. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, you're welcome, Patrick Stout. We got that. Okay, cool. Yeah, you'll find... I've, and pa believe me, Patrick Stout, I answered that question because I've tried before. It's a waste of time. Like, okay. No point in getting crazy with the underneath color. Just paint that Panzer gray and move right along to the top coat, whether that's a desert DAC worn off or a whitewash worn off. Same with NATO stuff, if, like or Japanese modern, if you're doing the winter versions or like a Swedish piece that has the, you know, a peacetime winter uh, campaign going on. Uh, nog in the nog, you're welcome, my friends. You have a good Monday. Um, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you'll find anything that's under a distempered paint. Just put the base colors down because you, you're going to lose 99% of it. Uh, what else? So yeah, I should get the snow in this week uh, to do the woodland scenic snow with the tracks and the wheels. Uh, and I just was waiting to get that in, and then we'll do, we'll 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 start move. This will move along fast. Now we're in the final. What you're seeing here, I just have to continue on. But basically, it's kind of it's set in stone now. We've got a good look to this. Uh, it's stowage and tracks are going to be the final thing. Yeah, Marino is a lifelong McLean. It was funny because I thought the same thing, and I know Christian, you probably heard the same thing too. I think it was Martin Brundle said it. Um, and I will touch on Michele Abaretto as well, because I did actually meet Michele Abaretto uh, the, the month or two at Laguna Seca before he went to test and then passed away with Audi. Uh, they, they named the Curva, uh, the Parabolica, Parabolica after uh, Michele Abaretto now, which was I thought was a really nice gesture. Uh, but it was funny because they were saying it's a Ferrari McLaren duel for a minute today. I was like, God, that sounds vaguely familiar. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was kind of a, it was, it was a pretty interesting race actually, truth be told. And I think it would have been interesting even if they hadn't uh, crashed, uh, it would have definitely been interesting. I think Ricardo had a chance to pull it off anyway, to be honest with you. He had a 50, 50 shot, even if Max and Lewis stayed in, uh, enjoy the rest of your day guys. Uh, Matt 58. Thank you guys. Zal, have a good Monday. Mike and chat TC, everybody, TJ and, and, and TC and everybody else. Uh, y'all have a good day, Josh, uh, Zach. Oh, Hey Zach. I didn't see you there. How you doing, buddy? How's it out there in, in Michigan? I did watch a little bit of the Michigan Washington game last night too. Uh, not as good, but Oregon Ducks, baby. Woo -hoo! That was a hell of a ball game. Uh, I will say if you guys are not paying attention, uh, college football, listen to Nick Saban's press conference. <laughs> it's a reckoning. That'll be my reckoning with varnishes. There is a reckoning coming. Um, but yeah, do we have some good conversations? Uh, Plastic Posse. Everybody, Scott, you have a good day. Everybody, two hands. Be good, my friend. Stay out of trouble. Dimitri, I hope we helped you out a little bit. Uh, hopefully, we've got some answers for you. Chris Pabs, you're my boy. Uh, we'll see you in stream this week. We'll come in and say hi to you guys. Uncle Night Shift, what about him? Did he? Did I see? Oh, yo, what's up, Martin? How are you, brother? Painting stowage and figures without any shading? When? Uh, 
I don't know. Uh, no, I, there's no figures for me, dude. I'm not painting any figures. Um, there's no figures on this, but I'll probably get to the stowage, um, probably tarps and wood and, and just gathering of gear on the back of this thing a couple weeks. I'll let you know. Uh, I'll send you a note, my friend. Um, Darren Tour, uh, what else is going on? Yeah, I'm just wrapping up. It's the end of the three o'clock for me. So we're kind of coming to the end of this. Uh, yeah, Michele Alvaretto. Yeah, I, I was able to get his autograph. So he drove the first Audi LM cars. I think it was LMP. It was the, I think it was called maybe the A9, maybe. It was the black LMP car that was open top before they started winning. Uh, he drove it at Laguna Seca. That was the Monterey Historic Races that summer that I went up to and saw. And he was walking around. I got a photo with him and got his. And it was really cool because we have the same name, English and Italian. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, Nadia, his wife's name was Nadia. And he had uh, two girls and we had two female dogs. So it was kind of like we had this it was a fun little five minute conversation with him. It was really, really nice. He was a super nice guy. I was really, really bummed when he passed uh, shortly after that tire blowout on a high speed test. Flipped the car, crashed. It was really tough. But yeah, it was nice that they they named the curb. He won a couple, I think, for three races with Ferrari in the 80s and 90s. And Kelly Alberto, he was a good driver. One of my favorites. Uh, what else? What else we got? Everybody good? Happy weekend. Happy Monday. Have a good night, uh, everybody. Enjoy football wherever you're at. There's some games still on this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow night, all that good stuff. So uh, we will see you guys Wednesday. I'll post up Tuesday what I'll be doing. Um, probably be a continuation for right now so I can get all this stuff out of the way so we can start new stuff in the next coming weeks. Uh, Frank Kello, 29, it's a pleasure to work that late at the bench while you're live. Uh, that's cool. Thank you. Uh, bonsoir from Paris. Oh, God, I wish I was in Paris right now. <laughs> bonsoir, mon ami. Appreciate everybody. Thank you, guys. This has been fun as always. A little bit more mellow, but we got some good stuff done on the brushwork, on the oils. A little bit of rust and a little bit of oxidation. Neil, you're welcome. Zal, have a good one, buddy. Martin, take care. Uh, I heard your, I heard the podcast. Nice interview that you did. And then uh, I hope you heal up fast so you can get back to walking around normally. You're close. You're close, my friend. Uh, Christian, we'll talk to you soon, buddy. Everybody else, everybody have a good one. All right. I'm off. No more questions. Everybody take care. Have a good night.